Well, happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to another live lawn care Q&A. My name is Ron Henry, and I am here to help answer your lawn care questions. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. We're super happy to have you here. The way this works is really simple. On your screen, you will see a chat box. And in that chat box, you enter your question, concern, comment of the day, and I work through them in the order that they come in. Now, sometimes I have the answer, sometimes I do not. But either way, we have an awesome time talking about lawn care and sometimes life. So guys, tonight should be a fun show. You know, it's a question that I, I, I often get is, you know, how do you create an amazing lawn? Like you're gonna start from, from beginning to end, like starting from, you know, a train wreck of a lawn, which most of you guys don't have, but lawn that's got, got some challenges. How do you move from that to a golf course quality lawn? So that's gonna be some of the talking points that we're gonna go through tonight. Um, it's gonna be, should be a fun show. I think that anyone that's that's new is gonna get, get a lot of value out of it. And I think it's appropriate for this time of year, now that we're entering the season, you know, we're you know, getting out pre-emergent and those types of things to try and set yourself up for success are um, are really upon us. We got some new blog posts that were out this week and um, yeah, should be a fun time. As always, we're coming to you guys live on YouTube, which is our primary platform. You can also um, see us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. For those of you guys that are here on, on Instagram, feel free to be part of the conversation too. You're not gonna be able to see what happens in the main broadcast, but still feel free to... Um, to chime in and I will just bounce back and forth between you guys and the folks on YouTube to make sure that you are not left out. We got Jojo in the house this evening, a couple other folks, Dan, a few other people. Thanks you guys for coming to hang out. I appreciate um, all the love and support. All right, cool. So let's see what we have in the live stream this evening. Let's see what we got to kick it off. We got Jason Harrison here um, starting out. He says one of two. So it's like a, a two part question. So question one or point one, he says, uh, I love the Miramichi uh, pest control and normally fog my house, porch, and patio once per month. I've seen a noticeable difference with pests like gnats, crane flies year over year during the summer. Nice, nice. And then um, second part, two of two, is I am thinking about throwing some in the tank and to treat the laundering periods of high pest emergence. I'm already spraying. It's just adding one more thing to the tank, maybe with foliar apps. Yeah, yeah, there's no issue with doing that at all, Jason. If you want to, to add some of the pest control in the tank, along with the liquid fertilizer spraying, along with your Primo app, you can absolutely do that. They all mix very nicely together. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a good plan, especially if you know you, you're, you know, if you got like mosquitoes or other just irritating insects that makes, uh, you know, spending time in the lawn less fun. 
then yeah, feel free to, to add that to the tank as well. You're not gonna hurt anything. Again, it all mixes nicely together and, and sprays nicely. For any of you guys that are wondering what he's talking about, so Miramichi Green, while you guys are, are know them primarily for their biosimilants, which is what I talk about primarily, they also make um, like a, they make an organic weed control product, but they also make a non-toxic pest control, which is it's an excellent product. So that's what Jason is referring to. It is, is this guy right here. So we go to shop and then, fungicide and insecticide, it is this guy. So the cool thing about this with it being non-toxic, um, it's it relies on um, a blend of soaps, oils, and some other secret sauce that Miramichi has in there. Um, you know, treats um, uh, mosquitoes, gnats, chinch bugs, roaches, a lot of, um, a lot of the, the, the ones, a lot of the bugs that we really hate. So let me, I can tell you what else is on here. Uh, ticks, aphids, white flies, um, ants, and no seum. So again, all that in, in something that is a product that's non-toxic, you can mix along with your other apps that um, that you're putting down. And a great point, Jason, as far as, you know, adding it to your regimen. If you already got it and you want to, you know, keep the lawn um, more pleasant to be in, um, in a way that's also, you know, as, as, as environmentally friendly as possible, I am, I am all for that. I wholeheartedly uh, endorse that, um, that plan as far as using that in your regular foliar sprays. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea at all. And what you might do, Jason, is because the pest control lasts for three to four weeks, you might do it every other time. I mean, you could do it every two weeks when you spray everything else, but really you could, you know, every other every other um, uh, app is is probably gonna be just fine in case you want to like, preserve the product and get, get more, you know, apps out of it. So just really up to you. I guess try it out and see what kind of results you get and then you can adjust accordingly. All right, we got Papa Mo's Low in the house saying, happy Friday, Ron. What's going on, Papa Moslo? Hopefully you're doing well. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Friday to come hang out and talk about lawn care and creating an amazing lawn. Our first question of the evening comes from Los. So Los has a question. He says, hey, Ron, what's the best time to drop Bermuda grass seed? It's a good question, Los. Um, most grass seed that you, Bermuda grass seed will have a temperature range, a soil temperature range on the bag that it recommends. Uh, like in the past when I've done Princess 77 and Arden 15, it's in the mid 60s. So soil temperatures in the mid 60s trending warmer. So in Northeast Georgia, from a time frame standpoint, again, this varies from year to year, but uh, normally around uh, late April, early May time frame is when that window opens as far as, um, you know, as far as the soil temperature and conditions being right to grow a Bermuda lawn from seed. So if you're doing a full renovation and you're deciding you want to go the grass seed route instead of sod, the late April, early May time frame is when I would look into it. But again, I'm giving you this, this time frame based on me being in, in Georgia. If you're in another part of the country, get a soil thermometer, use um, some of the tools online to determine when the average soil temps in your area are in the mid 60s, getting trending warmer. And that's when you um, will apply your grass seed and, and we'll get a good result. So hopefully that is useful to you. Uh, thanks for that question. And you know, even though you didn't ask this Los, I'm still, I mean, I'm still gonna try and talk you out of doing that. I'm still gonna say, you know what? Growing grass from seed, growing Bermuda grass from seed is hard mode. Like people look at a price of a, of a bag of Bermuda grass seed and say, you know, this is a lot cheaper than going out and buying sod. And yes and no, right? I mean, the 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 thing you have to realize when you try and grow a lawn from grass is one, um, it takes while the grass seed is not necessarily the necessarily the most expensive part, you spend a lot of money in water. Because you think about it, to get Bermuda grass to germinate and to do well, you're talking about not allowing the lawn to, the, the, the grass to dry, dry out. So depending on where you are in the country, that could mean. In most cases, it's gonna mean watering at least twice a day. It can mean watering three times a day for several weeks. To put it in perspective, the last time I did um, Arden 15, which was many, many moons ago, the water bill for that month was like around $750, which is a lot for, for water. Um, and you look at the price of the grass seed, it was like less, it's about half that, right? So in not, that's not including all the prep work and everything else that goes into it. So. You really want to ask yourself whether it's the way you want to go as far as establishing a new lawn. Like if you're looking to renovate um, a lawn from from scratch, like there's so many nice Bermuda cultivars that are out now. I mean, even Tifway 419. A lot of people kind of you know throw shade at Tifway, but Tifway's nice looking grass. You know, so Tifway 419. Uh, you know, Tiff Tough, uh, Tahoma 31, the new kid on the block. You get when you go to sods, you have options that um, that you don't necessarily get in a lot of the improved common Bermudas, which is what most Bermuda grass seed is. So it's something to consider. You know, if you're going to go through all the trouble of doing a renovation, look at some of the sods, especially if your lawn is not that big. It's 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 not going to be that much in it as far as um, choosing between the two. And I, you know, you literally go from no lawn to lawn, which is really nice. 
and you don't have to worry about, you know, again, when you, when you plant grass seed, there's nothing that says it's all going to grow in evenly. You know, you think that you you prepare the entire lawn, you put the grass seed out, you water it, and you think it's all going to grow in evenly. You'll have some areas that will lag behind that will struggle, and you may have to go and reseed those areas where they're just going to take longer to grow in. You eliminate a lot of that when you go to sod. So literally, it's you go from like no lawn to lawn, and you get to, you know, get to, to have a choice of a lot of the, the newer grasses, which are, are nice. You know, they're going to be a finer, finer leaf texture, nicer color, better drought, um, you know, drought resistance. They go dormant later. They come out of dormancy sooner. Like there's a lot of really good reasons to go with some of the improved, um, some of the hybrids. Um, but unfortunately, they're really available in most cases only in sod format. So just something to consider. I know you didn't ask that, but just something for you to think about since you're going through a um, a major renovation project. Sounds like you're going to you're gonna be having some fun, some fun this uh, this time of year. All right, guys. So, the the talking point for this evening is like how to get an amazing lawn, right? So you guys saw the thumbnail. Like, how do you get how do you get a, a great lawn in twenty twenty four? So, while there are lawns that look pretty like look better, I think this is a, a good decent example of I think a pretty good looking lawn. This is um, my uh, my back lawn from a couple years ago when I got the outlet. And you see this every time if you look at the live stream openings, this is what it, what it ends with. So how do you get along like that, right? Like what's the, what's the process of going from say something that looks like this, right? To, to our goal, which is something that looks more like that. So how do you go from, from this? How do you go, actually, how do you go from this to this, right? And it's, the biggest thing is it's a lot of consistency, it's a lot of mowing and time. But the thing is, there's a there's a step by step approach that I, I think works well. There's obviously other ways of doing this, but it's a process that that I have followed process that I teach in the Golf Course Lawn Academy and one that I've, I've shared with with countless folks on YouTube and through email and whatnot, and they've followed it and they've gotten great results. So it's like a five step process, five step process to to take a lawn that again, looks, uh, you know, seen better days, something that looks looks a lot like this and turn into a lawn that you can be proud of. It can definitely be at least the, the best lawn on your street, right? So the first step, step one, and if you guys want to, you know, make notes of this, I, I, I've got it captured in infographic. I can show you where that is, but I'll just be talking to them because I have like some screenshots here and everything. But if you go to the Golf Force Lawn Store, go to shop and just click on shop and then scroll down, you'll see an infographic that I created years ago that kind of outlines the entire process here, right? So step one through step five. All right. So step one is you know, eliminating weeds in your lawn, which is, you know, the thing that the question I probably get more than anything else outside of you know, which fertilizer should I use is how do I get rid of the weeds that are in my lawn? Because that's the idea behind a great looking lawn is for the most part, we want a monoculture, right? We want like a grass, a lawn that only has just grass, just the stuff that we want to look at that's pretty and any other plants that are in there that don't look that like the grass, we designate as weeds and we want them gone, right? So the first step when it comes to, to eliminating weeds in your lawn is probably the most important step is figuring out what kind of grass you have. You know, if you have a warm season lawn, so Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, Centipede, uh, those are considered warm season grasses. And if you have cool season turf grasses, which are like your fescue, your rise, your Kentucky bluegrass, those are your cool season grasses. The reason why this is important is if you look at the weeds that are here, for the most part, these weeds can grow in both warm and cool season grass. You can see them in both types of lawns. So you can see them in my lawn or you can see them in a lawn that's in you know Ohio, somewhere where they have cool season grass. The difference is, is the herbicides that you have to use to control the weeds, to get rid of the weeds, is specific to the grass type. So if you use like a herbicide that is designed for use on cool season lawns, like your ryegrass, fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, if you use a, a herbicide that's designed for that, for use on those types of grasses, on a warm season grass, you're going to damage, injure, and in some cases kill um, parts of your lawn. Conversely, if you use a herbicide that is designed for warm season grass, let's take something, we'll use some examples. So, so uh, example of a herbicide that's designed for warm season turf grass, something like Celsius, if you were to go and spray this on a rye lawn, a Kentucky bluegrass lawn, or a fescue lawn, you're going to damage, injure, and depending on the, on the rates you go with, you could even kill off portions of your lawn. So knowing what kind of grass you have is really important because it's going to allow us to, to then, you know, take the step of controlling the weeds by spraying them out, by spraying the correct, the correct herbicide on them. So whether you got cool season grass or warm season grass, um, that's important to know. And you can figure it out by just taking a picture of it. You can go to Google Images, and um, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll tell you what kind of grass you have. We've got some, some blog posts on the golf course lawn store. If you go to the resources section and then blog, we've got, um, we've got lots of, um, 
you know, lots of blogs in here. One of them is around identifying the kind of grass that you have in your lawn. I'll find it here and I'll, I'll link it to you here in a second. Um, but that's the thing that that's the, that's when it comes to spraying herbicides, if there's one thing you don't want to get wrong, it's that, right? It's, it's knowing the kind of grass that you have, right? So again, so some so examples of warm season herbicides, Celsius, Certainty, excellent combination for warm season grasses only. And then for cool season grasses, for the most part, you're talking about something like Tenacity, um, Pylex, there's other, there's other herbicides that are designed or designated as safe for cool season grasses. So it's important to know that. So we figured out what kind of grass we have, right? And when it comes to getting rid of weeds in a lawn that look like this, so in this case, we could look at these weeds and we say they're already there. I think any of us that are looking at that picture will say, these weeds have already emerged. They're already in the lawn. They're already messing up life. We're already, you know, getting, getting you know, bad looks from the neighbors, maybe even a, a letter from our house association saying, hey, you got to do something about that, what you got going on there, right? You got to clean that up. So when it comes to applying herbicides to take care of weeds, they really, they're two, um, there, there, there are two major types or, or phases of the weed's life that you want to be aware of. So you've got pre-emergent herbicides, as the name kind of implies, prior to the weeds emerging, hence the name pre-emergent, like prior to emerging. And then you have post-emergent herbicides. Everything I've shown you here tonight so far, like Celsius, Certainty, Tenacity, um, Tenacity is kind of a specialty one that can be both pre and post emergent, but for the most part, it's considered a post emergent herbicide. Um, sedge hammer, those are considered post emergent herbicides, meaning the weeds already grown in, you're already, you know, getting evil looks from your neighbors and you're trying to get rid of them. That's where your post emergent herbicides um, um, reside. So, a secret, a thing, a thing that will make your life way easier. And the nice thing about it is it's not too late for pretty much everyone that's within the sound of my voice to still do this is to use the other class of herbicides this time of year, the preventative ones called pre-emergent. So pre-emergent are, are a class of herbicides that are designed to interrupt the growth cycle of weeds in the earliest phases. So whenever weeds begin to germinate, they try and throw roots. The idea behind um, most pre-emergent herbicides is they, they kill or they damage the ability for the plant to grow roots, preventing the weeds from growing in the first place, right? So kind of like the saying your mom always used to tell you, like a pound, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Pre-emergent is that ounce of perfection. From a cost standpoint, pre-emergents are also a lot less expensive, um, for the most part, in most cases, than post-emergent herbicides. So if you look at like, um, you know, the cost of like Celsius, Certainty, Tenacity, Sedgehammer, like you look at the cost of those products and also the time it takes to apply them and to correctly use them compared to what pre-emergent costs, pre-emergent is a, is a much better use of your time and it does a lot of the heavy lifting, right? So, so thing one, we, we eliminate, we determine what kind of weeds we, what kind of grass we have, um, and the weeds we're trying to control, and we use the post-emergence to get rid of them, but then to prevent more weeds, and something you can do this time of year, to prevent more weeds from growing in the spring and fall, that's where pre-emergence come in. Now, when it comes to pre-emergence, there are some that are specialty that are, that are designated for warm season grass and cool season grass, but the ones I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight, really, they will work on both grass types. So, some of the most common pre-emergence to use during the springtime are a pre-emergent called prediamine, the, the brand name for it from Syngenta we call Barricade. And then um, another pre-emergence that's very common is um, one called, uh, the active ingredient is called Dithiapir or the brand name Dimension. Both those pre-emergents are safe for warm and cool season grasses. Both of them do a great job of keeping uh, weeds out of your lawn. So again, it, it, they'll do a lot of the heavy lifting as far as preventing weeds from even growing in the first place, limiting your need for the more expensive and more time consuming post-emergent herbicides. So as far as pre-emergents go, um, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. They come in both liquid and granular form. If you're brand new, granulars are easier because literally you just set the sprayer, the spreader setting. You uh, you met, you put it enough in, in the hopper. You walk the entire lawn. You walk it in, and you're done. Right. So it's pretty easy. So the where you can find um, pre-emergent herbicides if you go to shop and then go to Weed Killer. Under there, you'll see our carefully uh, created filters for pre-emergent. And in there, you've got um, you got Dimension, you got Prodiamine. These two, one of these two, are are, gonna, are excellent choices for a spring pre-emergent product. Prodiamine uh, tends, I find, tends to last a little bit longer as far as how long it works. Both products will stay resident in the soil for three to four months, which is good because that's it, that's during the time period when weeds are most likely to germinate. Um, so either of these in granular form are excellent. Um, you've also got prodiamine available in liquid form or water dispersible granules. So if you're someone that likes to use a backpack sprayer, like to spray your pre-emergent as liquids, you can go with it in liquid form. Spectacle Flow is a specialty pre-emergent. It's designed for warm season grass only. It's one that I really only recommend using in the fall. So for, so for this time of year, springtime, 
uh, Dimension or Prodiamine are, are your jam. Um, the, the difference between the two of them, the Dimension, the advantage that Dimension has is that if you have crabgrass already growing in your lawn, so young crabgrass, Dimension has the ability to control young crabgrass, so, so it, can, it can kill young crabgrass just, just that started growing in your lawn, whereas Prodiamine does not. So it's strictly pre-emergent. Uh, Dithiopyr is also primarily a pre-emergent, but it has some limited control against crabgrass. So whichever one you decide to use, um, you can get a great result there. All right, so we have identified uh, our grass. We have had a brief discussion around pre and post-emergent herbicides. I didn't actually talk to you about, um, in case you already have weeds in your lawn, where you can find those. But as far as your, your post-emergent herbicides, Celsius and Certainty are for warm season grasses. If you scroll down, you got uh, Tenacity and Sedgehammer um, for cool season grasses. Tenac sedgehammer will work on both cool and warm season grasses, but if you are trying to control sedges and you have warm season turf, Certainty is a much better choice, in my opinion, than Sedgehammer. So that's why I kind of have, I just kind of lump it in with the cool season grass herbicides. So we have kits for both of those. So if you have a cool season lawn, the Tenacity Sedgehammer kit saves you time and money. And if you have warm season grass, the Celsius Certainty kit saves you time and money. It has everything you need to be able to control weeds in the appropriate grass type. Also new because some of you guys have been asking for it, is to make it easier for you. If you have just an individual packet of Celsius, we also have kits for each one of those. So you have Celsius, you can also add surfactant and marker dye and save yourself a little bit of money and gives you everything you need to get a better result controlling weeds. If you have the larger bottle, same thing, a kit for that one that has, um, that gives you the surfactant and the marker dye that helps produce a, a better result when it comes to controlling weeds in your, in your lawn. All right, so... That's, that's the thing to keep in mind. And there's there's, there's there's kits or mini kits for each of those for um, Sedgehammer and also for, for uh, Tenacity as well. So you can find all that. I'll link that here in the chat now before we move on to the next section. You can find that here um, here in there, there on the Golf Course Lawn Store. All right, cool. So we have found, we found that we have weeds in our lawn. We have determined that we are gonna control them with a post-emergent uh, post herbicide. We're gonna prevent new weeds using pre-emergent herbicides, we are on to step two, which is where the fun starts. Because weeds aren't really the fun part of like taking care of lawns, like getting, you know, putting out fertilizer, making the lawn look awesome, that's more fun. Most people enjoy that more so than taking care of weeds, right? So step two, again, probably the second most question that I get after, um, you know, how do, I, how do I get rid of this weed? It's probably fairly equal is what fertilizer should I use on my lawn? So Ron, I got the weeds controlled, the lawn's looking better, I'm not getting nasty grams from the House Association anymore. How do I go from eh to domination level as far as my, uh, my, my lawn goes? An important part of, of accomplishing that is ensuring that your soil has like adequate nutrient levels, right? You have to remember like grass, gra like great grass, is a byproduct of, of, of a good environment, right? So um, good a, a good soil, good nutrients in the soil, adequate water, adequate sunlight. So it's almost like, you know, the person that says, hey, I wanna have like six pack abs, or I wanna, you know, I wanna have a, 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 an awesome looking physique. Like chasing that directly is kind of difficult. The, the better way to go about it is you ask yourself, like what's the stuff that creates a great looking physique? What's the stuff that creates a great looking lawn? And go after that. And then the lawn is like a byproduct. Like you can't you can't really help but getting getting great great grass if you do the stuff that makes for a great lawn, right? So the question, as far as that you guys, a lot of you guys will have is like, how do I know which fertilizers to choose? There's tons of fertilizers in any of the big box stores. There's lots that we offer on the Golf Course Lawn Store. How do you know which one is correct for your lawn? The way you know is by doing what's called a soil test. And a soil test, as intimidating as it sounds, is actually probably one of the easiest things you're going to do which is you collect samples, little cores, little, little clumps of soil from different parts of your lawn. You send them into a lab. They will, in a week or so, they will return. They'll send you back results and say, hey, Ron, based on the sample that you sent us, here are the nutrient deficiencies in your soil. And this is what we recommend as far as options for fixing it. So an example of what your soil test would look like, results can look like it would be something like this, right? So this is an example of a soil test set that I have. And in this case, you know, you've got your nitrogen, your phosphorus, ammonium, like all the, the various, um, the, the different various parameters, various nutrients that make up, um, that make up your, I'm saying that's make up your soil, but that, that's your, that's your, your, the grass needs in, in adequate amounts. Um, it measures each one of those, right? So the, uh, the question of which fertilizer is best for my lawn is answered via a soil test, answered by a soil test. So if we take a look at this one, for example, right? So this is a, for a lawn that has, you know, nitrogen is low, phosphorus is low, potassium are low, right? So which are 
the the three macronutrients, meaning the, 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 the three nutrients that your soil, that your grass needs in greatest amounts, right? You'll sometimes see them labeled as NPK, um, or there'll be the three numbers on a, on a fertilizer bag. That's the ones that we're talking about. So N being nitrogen, uh, P being phosphorus, and then K being uh, potassium. So NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, so in a case like this, let's say, for example, this were your, your soil test, right? You sent your soil test out, you got your results back, and let's just say that this were, was you, right? Not great, but hey, at least we know where we are. So in this case, for a soil that needs a bit of everything, needs nitrogen, needs phosphorus, needs potassium, when you go over to the fertilizer section of the golf course lawn store, which is, let's face it, that's probably the most fun part of the store, right? You go to shop, and then you go to lawn fertilizer. You'll see here the fertilizers all have the number designations for NPK. So Humic Max has 16% nitrogen, no phosphorus, and 8% potassium. Probably not the best fit based on our soil test results. Um, the Stress 12024, 12% nitrogen, no phosphorus, again, mm. And then 24% potassium, not the best fit based on our soil test results. And in the middle here, we have the complete 14714. So it's got some nitrogen, it's got some phosphorus, and it has some potassium. So this, based on soil test results that look like this, would be a great fit. That would be the best fit of those three options to use on your your lawn, right? To, as far as which one, which fertilizer makes the best bet, right? So if we go back to our infographic, so we've gone through our various steps. We have we have identified weeds. You've controlled the weeds between pre and post emergent herbicides. We have done a soil test. Yay for that! And then now, based on the soil test, we're going to fertilize the lawn. This is where the fun parts happens. This is where you guys get to get out there and and have a grand old time. We will fertilize the lawn based on our soil test results, right? So you add the correct fertilizer, and there's no guessing at this point, right? There's no guessing because you know, right? You know the stuff that you're putting on the lawn right now is what it needs based on what my, uh, my my soil test data tells me, so I know I'm doing the right thing. It's almost like when you go to the doctor and you know you to figure, do you need to take like a, a multivitamin? Do you have any deficiencies in your health? What can you use to help supplement that? A soil test is exactly that. It tell, it's that for your soil. It tells you like what you need to use to supplement your um, the nutrient levels in your soil and um, to, to a term they often use is to amend the nutrient levels in your soil. So based on that, you will fertilize the lawn and now when it comes to that, there's different levels of, um, of going about it. A very basic fertilization program could simply be, you know, you're just going to get a granular fertilizer that takes care of the macros, maybe has a little bit of mac micronutrients in it. You're going to apply that once per month and you're just going to call it good, right? So you could do that. That's like, that's like the basic level. And, that, and honestly, that's going to do a pretty good job for most of you. That's going to be a lot better than you are. If you had a lawn that's looking like, uh, like this, you start feeding the lawn properly based on soil test data and you begin mowing, you're going to have, your lawn's going to look way better than, than it has in the past, right? If you're getting, want to get more advanced, that's where you can start introducing like granular biostimulants, which are going to help Im improve the ability of the soil to make use of the nutrients that you're putting in. It's where you can start getting into more advanced feeding strategies like spoon feeding. You guys hear me talk about that a lot, where you are using a combination of granular fertilizer and liquid fertilizers to produce an overall better result. So it just depends on really, you know, how um, how how intense you want to uh, to get with this. As far as content on that, there's um. As far as the more advanced approach, if, if you guys are interested in, in spoon feeding, I've got a blog here that I'm going to link in the chat for you now that talks all about it, uh, talks about what the benefits of spoon feeding are, um, how I like to go about doing it, um, application rates, products, all this kind of stuff. So you guys will probably get some value out of that if you decide to go uh, if you decide to go that route, all right? So we have... Let's go back to our infographics. So we can see we can see where we are in this journey of going from lawn that's getting a nasty ground from the House Association to a lawn that looks like this, right? So we're getting there. We're getting there. So everything we've been doing up to this point is controlling weeds, figuring out the nutrient requirements for the lawn. And so we got a weed-free lawn. We got great soil. And now, guys, now if you're in the sound of my voice, this is the thing. This is the thing that will set you apart from your neighbors because everything else here is is relatively easy. You know, you spray for herbicides, you'll do that, you know, maybe a couple of rounds, you should get, get the, the, the weeds cleaned up. Pre-emergent, it's like twice a year type thing. Fertilization, once a month type thing. But the per the thing that, that really sets you apart, that allows you to earn your stripes as far, like literally, literally allows you to earn your stripes as far as getting a lawn that looks like this is, is mowing, is mowing is this stuff, right? Is getting out there and mowing. Like the diff the biggest difference between 
a golf course and a residential lawn outside of the nutrient program is the fact that they just mow way more than most people, than, than people that have like, like home lawns do, right? If you ask your, your average neighbor, as far as how often they mow their lawn, they mow maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks. Like they mow often enough to not get into trouble with the house association, right? Now, whereas golf courses, you look at the greens, they get mowed every day, fairways every other day, depending on the course. And really that's what it takes, or that's what it, you have to approach to really get an amazing stand of grass. So, you, so everything we've been doing, cleaning up the weeds, soil testing, you know, putting out a, a good a good uh, nutrient program between biosimilants and fertilizer. All that stuff is about improving the environment to get the soil, to get the grass to really do what it needs to do. The appearance comes from mowing, right? So if you really want an amazing lawn, you really have to commit to at least twice per week no, mowing. I know, it's a lot, sounds like a lot of work, right? But it's like once on the weekend and then really once during the week if you're really serious about getting an amazing lawn. You know, as a general rule, and I've said this before jokingly, but given everything else being equal, all else being equal, he or she who mows most wins. That's who's gonna get the best looking lawn based on, on the fact that they um you know they just they spend more time with their with their with their cultural practices, really just 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 cut, cutting the lawn, making it look its absolute best. So if we go back to our info infographic and then we're gonna get into all the questions you guys have. I know they're piling up, but I wanted to get through this. So if we go back to our infographic. We have control the weeds. We have we have won the battle of weeds. We have we have soil tested. We have fertilized. We have mowed, mowed, and when you think you're done, you've mowed some more. And then step five is just to enjoy. It's a byproduct of of all the hard the hard work uh, that you have done. So in, in a nutshell, I mean, no, we've been going on for about you know half an hour now, but as far, in a nutshell, as far as get taking a lawn that goes from zero to hero, it, you'd be amazed in the course of. 90 days, you know, 60 to 90 days, how much of a difference you can make in a lawn if you approach it, you know, with a, with the, if you go after it with the right approach, right? And it, hopefully what I'm explaining to you guys makes a lot of sense from a standpoint of just, um, not just guessing, like most people go out there and they just go, they buy a fertilizer and just throw it out and hope for the best, you know, and hope for the best and just, we'll see what, see what happens. And, you know, if you're the people that are, that are serious about anything in life, you know, people that are in sports that are at the top of their game, people that are in, in, you know, in industry or business at the top of their game, like they measure it, they take a methodical approach to it. And the people that are serious about turf grass, it's the same thing, right? So if you guys want to have the, the best possible lawn, um, like what I've outlined is an approach that I think is relatively simple to follow and produces, I think produces pretty good results. So hopefully you guys um, got some um, some value out of that. So, you know, and really once you got the, the basis covered, that's when you will start jumping into things like verticutting and top dressing and, you know, all this other stuff, all those stuff are sweeteners on top, but the foundational stuff is what I just, just covered. So hopefully, hopefully that was good for you guys. All right, so... We got a couple of super chats. Let me get into those. If you guys are enjoying the live stream, we got 120 people here in the live stream, only 60 likes. Guys, this pains my heart. Why, why you guys do me like that? I mean, I'm, 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 I put together a bunch of work into, you know, doing this for you guys and you guys can only give me like, only half of you guys hit the like button. Come on. So if you are enjoying the live stream or if you're not enjoying the live stream, hit the like button. It's absolutely free to do. It's a great way to support the channel and the content. And uh, it would it would really make me feel good before we start jumping into the uh, the other questions. All right, so that's what we have here on the gram. Um, we've got the golf course lawn kit. Uh, definitely need to spot street trouble areas in the lawn. Yeah, and it's it's true. Some of the points here that some folks have. Um, some of the folks that we got. Oh, I'm at with Mary Richard Green. What's going on, sir? Some of the. Some of the points you have to realize is that yes, even if you use pre-emergent, so someone here in Instagram pointed out, even if you use pre-emergent, you will still have a little bit of breakthrough here and there, but you're not going to have a lawn that looks like that. Like that's a train wreck. Like that's that's a whole lot of that's a whole lot of pain and suffering, and you know it's, it's going to take a while to really get that looking its best, right? So um, remember, pre-emergent isn't perfect, but it's it does it makes your life so much easier. So if I could encourage you guys to do anything, if you're saying, hey, Rod, you covered a lot of stuff. What's the thing that I should be doing right now? Pre-emergent. That's the thing you should be doing in your lawn right now if you're in the Southeast United States. If you're up somewhere up north, you still got snow on the ground, you still have time. But if you're Southeast US, um, it is a, is a good time to get your pre-emergent out. When it comes to pre-emergent, a little bit early is better than a little bit late because really it works best prior to the weeds emerging, right? Hence the name. All right, so our first super chat comes from Lance F. From Lance F, our first super chat of the evening. Thank you so much, Lance. Super chat. He says, does the Miramichi green essential G uh, in early season help dormant grass turn green faster in the spring? 
barring my soil sample results are all on point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's a good question, Lance. I mean, the, the idea behind Essential G is it, you could think of it as almost like, like a vitamin pack for your soil. You've got some compost in there, biochar in there, humate, silica, um, reclaimed coffee grounds. It's got, it's got all the good stuff as far as introducing more organic material to, um, to the soil, which is only going to help the, the lawn green up faster. You're just producing, a, you're just producing a, a healthier soil, which again, remember as we said earlier, like great grass is a byproduct of that. So it, it's only going to help, you know, my program again, since like mid 2020, I have applied um, a granular biosimilant essential G to my lawn, um, you know, every month. So if you live somewhere where the ground doesn't freeze, you can do it literally every month if you wanted to. So to answer your question, your case, you're on point, you're, you look at your soil test results, everything looking good, not a whole lot to do at this point. If you want to put some essential G down, you absolutely can. There's not going to not going to hurt anything. And for those of you guys that are wondering what Lance is talking about, there's a there's a biosimilant um, that I am a huge fan of. If you go to shop and remember green biosimilants, um, you've got essential G uh, right here. This is the this is the one that that this is a product that I use monthly on my lawn, and it's it just helps any any inputs to the soil work better. You can't really damage your lawn with it. It's a great product. Again, I've I wholeheartedly stand behind it. There's lots of folks that have been using it, and only only um, that only really have. Um, have, have had great results with it. So Lance, you a good question. That's a great question. You know what, for that Lance, for that, and again, I'm probably gonna get in trouble with the folks at Miramichi because I've been giving out a lot of shirts here lately, but Chris, this is a good question. You, sir, will be our Miramichi question of the evening. So if you ask yourself, what does that get me? I asked a question, I, you know, I gave a super chat, like it cost me money to get that question, right? However, you can recoup some of that cost by getting one of these awesome greatness from the ground up t-shirts. So if you want a free shirt, congratulations, you, um, you've won one. Just send me an email here at ron at golfcourselawn.com and I and say, hey, this is Lance F. from the live stream. Give me my free shirt because I asked a really good question and I will tell you how to get your shirt. How to get your shirt, you know what I mean? So if you're interested in that, um, congratulations. You are our, um, our Miramichi question of the week. Good stuff. So Ron at Golf Course Lawn, send me an email and I'll take, get you taken care of. And also because you are our first super chat, I also believe Lance, man, you're just, you're batting a thousand tonight. You will be our show sponsor. So there you go, Lance, your name in the lights for whatever, for whatever that means to you. You can screenshot this and say, hey, look guys, when you go to work and talk to your friends, you're the lawn nerds, be like, yo man, I'm famous. Look, check me out. See, that's me, my name. I'm up on the live stream. I'm sponsoring the show. I was, I was basically the lights, everything, the cameras. That's me. I'm, I'm helping make this happen. So that's, that's you tonight. So congrats, sir. Thanks for the great question. Again, reach out to Rufy with a shirt and we will get you, uh, we'll get you taken, get you taken care of, right? Get you taken care of. All right. So uh, the next question is from uh, Lawn Mower Master. He says, um, hey, Ron, what question for you. When I scout my lawn, will it erode Bermuda and wash away the soil? It shouldn't. No. I mean, when you scalp, you, again, there's different ways of scalping a lawn. I am not a fan of going too aggressive where you get right down to the dirt. I, if you're trying to get what I think is the best balance between um, the benefits of scalping without creating a bunch of unnecessary work for yourself is also like putting a lot of wear in your equipment, is whatever height of cut you want to maintain the lawn at, go a quarter of an inch, maybe half an inch below that. So if you're gonna maintain the lawn at say three, three quarters of an inch, 0.75 for real mowing, then you know scalp the lawn to, to half an inch, maybe just a little bit under half an inch and, and that's gonna put you in a really good spot to get a lot of the benefits. You, your Bermuda should not erode or, or lose any soil because you're still gonna have grass to hold on to the soil. And uh, and that's that's what I would do. I would not take it down to the dirt. I would go you know quarter of an inch, half an inch below where you intend to maintain the lawn and that will work just fine. So it's a good question, uh, Lawn Mower Master, as far as, um, as far as scalping height. And it's the time of year for that, guys. We're, get, we're getting close anyway. Depending on where you are in the country, you might be scalping already. Some folks, um, prior to their pre-emergent applications, like to do a, um, a lawn scalp or, you know, or just do something to clean up the debris in the lawn. So, uh, so yeah, if you've not done that, you're considering doing it, it's, um, it's not a bad thing. The, the, some of the benefits of, of, um, of scalping are you are going to get a, a green up sooner than lawns that don't get scalped. Typically two to three weeks, your lawn is going to green, green up faster. Um, you get rid of a lot of the dead grass, debris. You kind of give your lawn a nice reset to start the season off, which is which is good. I think is valuable. And um, yeah, I mean it's, it's work, but it's um, it's a good thing to do if you have a Bermuda or a zoysia lawn. Cool season grasses, you don't really scalp those, but if you have a warm season 
uh, turf grass like Bermuda or Zoysia, you know, scalping it is a, a good idea as far as getting a good reset to the season. Something else to consider too, is let's say you don't have like tools like a verticutter or turf rake or ways to kind of manage debris throughout the season, right? If you, when you scalp the lawn, you're giving it a nice reset, getting rid of a lot of that fascist in the lawn, you can also reduce the likelihood of you having disease issues in the lawn versus just allowing what built up over the late fall and winter just to sit there and just start mowing it. Like you got all that, that thatch, that nice spongy layer where water and kind of tends to sit. Um, you know, you can, you can, you're creating conditions that are more likely for you to have problems with disease versus if you were to clean a lot of that stuff out. So hope that helps um, Lawnmower Master. Like it's, it's one of the best things you can do. Like the cultural practices of scalping, turf raking, verticutting. Like since I started doing those a couple of years ago, like as far as like getting mushrooms in my lawn, disease problems in my lawn, like that stuff, uh, you know, has all but about gone away. So it's, it's, it's good things to do in addition to mowing if you have the kit to be able to make it happen. It's a lot of work, but it's, uh, but it's, it's, I think it's, it's valuable, especially if you have a grass type that is, um, that can benefit from it. And if you guys want to learn about scalping your lawn in the spring, I am, um, I'll get you a blog post that we did on that topic, like should you scalp your lawn in the, um, actually we'll do this one. Um, what is lawn scalping, when should you do it? And there's also one about scalping your lawn in the early springtime, but uh, but yeah, this will this one will do the trick for you. So that one is all about lawn scalping. Good stuff, great question, uh, Lawnmower Master. Uh, next up, we got Papa Bo's Low. He says the Bermuda, The all, he didn't say the almighty Bermuda, but we'll just, we'll take it. The Bermuda is starting to make an appearance. Can't wait for this next cold snap to pass through this weekend. Sunny and warm days are on the horizon. Nice Papa Moslo. I like to hear that. Love to hear that. And you know, Lance, one thing I want to tell you, I, I would encourage you to get the shirt, like send me an email so you can get the uh, the shirt. We'll send it into you because here's the thing. I got, you know, a couple of these have gone out in the wild and I got a picture from Rusty. He might be in the live stream tonight. And you know, I can't necessarily say there's a, co a direct correlation between awesomeness in the lawn and wearing the shirt. However, however, I got some pictures from Rusty um, who, who won it a few weeks back. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, so this is, this is um, first of all, this lawn, right? Looking good, nice fescue lawn, looking, looking clean, pretty. Stripe action is on point. Now we have to, we have to take a second here and pause. Now, anyone that's an Alabama fan or you know, a Clemson fan, you avert your eyes, you will see the man has got the mower properly decorated. You see that Georgia sticker front and center, looking good, black and red. I mean, you know, it's 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 the colors look right, sticker looks good, and the grass is on point too. You know what I mean? So lawn looks great. In addition, if you want to know, hey, you know, how can I look? How can I be that person? Like when I'm flexing, you know, after I've got my lawn looking good, how, how can you look? Rusty sent me a picture. So you got the lawn in the background. You got his greatness from the ground up shirt. Looking clean, man. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And again, I can't necessarily say there's a direct correlation between wearing the shirt and an awesome, you know, awesome stand of turf grass, but it, it can't hurt. If anything, it, if anything, you look good while you're doing it, right? I mean, if, even if your lawn is in the weed, you know, the, the weed patch stage, at least you look sharp when you're out there working on the lawn wearing the shirt. So definitely send in, send your, send me the email, Lance. We'll get you taken care of so you can have some, uh, you know, you can have the accoutrement to look the part when you're out creating your golf course lawn. All right, we got Hook and Pool says the shirt matters. I agree, I agree. The shirt does matter. Uh, so we have a question here on Instagram from Mr. Looney. He says, hey Ron, I burned my Bermuda about a week ago. What are your tips um, for what next to do? Uh, yeah, so we kind of walk down down the uh, the path. So so burning your Bermuda is like a an alternative to scalping it. You know, you gotta be careful with that because some neighborhoods, they, they frown upon you setting your lawn on fire. If you're somewhere where you can do that and you feel comfortable doing it and you want to go for that, um, you know, by all means. Um, but, but I would say just walk down the uh, the path, right? So if you've already, um, you've already cleaned a lot of the debris out of the lawn from burning it, if you've not applied your, your pre-emergent, get that done. If you've not done a spring soil test as yet, get that done. And then based on, you know, getting your pre-emergent, you're gonna be doing everything you need to do to keep the weeds at bay. Your soil test is gonna give you the data you need to be able to make your fertilizer selections and then just wait for the lawn to begin to wake up, begin fer fertilizing it and then start mowing. You know what I mean? Mowing is the thing that most people don't do enough of. So you sounds like you're already on the right path. You know, we get we have a um, a month by month um, program that's free. It's not the same one that's in our in our Golf Course Lawn Academy, but it's still, I think, pretty useful, Mr. Looney. And I'll link here in the chat. I'm not sure if it's clickable for you on Instagram, but you can, you can find it. Uh, but this is our month by month 
um, lawn program that covers a lot of what I am talking about. Uh, let's see here. And guys, please excuse any typos because I don't have a producer. I'm kind of doing it all right. One one man one man show. One man band. All right. Other than the moderators, the moderators are doing know what they're doing. They they you know they are the silent heroes of the show. But um but yeah, I'm doing everything else. Okay. So um so as far as what I would, I just linked to the uh, gentleman on Instagram. If you are looking for a month by month breakdown, um this is free on the golf course lawn tour. I just linked it to you guys in the chat. So in February, kind of the option is like scalp your lawn. In this case, you already burned it, which, which is kind of a you know substitute for that. Um, perform a soil test, um, get your pre-immersion out, and you can just kind of walk down here, right? You can you start applying your fertilizer, carbon kit, essential G, consistent mowing. The one thing you'll notice every single month is consistent mowing, you know, consistent mowing, and consistent mowing, and consistent mowing. Almost like a like a broken record, right? Because that's the thing that's going to tie all of us together and really give you the, the appearance. This is a free schedule that you guys can follow. Again, it's based on what we, we teach in the Golf Course Lawn Academy. Um, and, you know, lots of folks follow this and get a great result in their, their lawn care program. You can mix and you can, you can take the parts of it that, that, um, that, that you like and, and use it. But I mean, that, that program, I can say works. It produces, produces a great, produces a great result as long as you are consistent with your mowing. All right. Okay, so yeah, you're very, very welcome, Mr. Looney. Um, okay, moving on. So I gotta start answering some questions because we are, we're behind them. I've been, I've been jabbing, I've been, been jibber jabbing too much. All right, Koi guy's up next. He says, Koi guy just became a member. Thank you so much, sir. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the love and support. Joining the channel. Thank you. And then uh, next up, we have uh, Tito Serrano. Tito Serrano, he says, um, soil test, uh, total nitrogen, N is 1.96, potassium, um, and phosphorus levels, all micros, very low. What should I use to help my line? Yeah, so um, send me, I mean, the, the end, your N sounds low. Let me, look, let me look here based on what I've got here. I mean, it'd be better if you can send me your, your soil test results to take a look at, uh, Tito, if you don't mind, because um, based on that, I'll be able to give you, I'll be able to give you a recommendation as far as um, what I would go with the, the, your, your P, your phosphorus sound looks like it's okay, but the N and K, sorry, your, why do you have, you have these listed differently. So you have, you have, you listed nitrogen, potassium, so no more it's NPK, you have them kind of transposed. So at any rate, send me this, your soil test results, like email them to me, ron at golfcourselon.com. I'll take a look at it and I will get you a result because you asked tonight, if you email me tonight and I get it, like you say, Hey, this is Tito from the live stream. I'll look through it and I'll give you an answer tonight before I go to bed. Promise. So, if, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, I don't have the, the, the results in front of me. So email me, email them to me and I will take a look at it and I'll get you an answer uh, this evening. So hope that helps. All right. Next up is Aaron Pate. He says, so I'm gonna use Celsius to kill some cool season grass mixed in with my St. Augustine. Should I do it now while it's still dormant or wait for it to green up? Okay, so you're saying if you want to, so you have cool season grass in your St. Augustine now. I imagine this time of year, Aaron, that the cool season grass is growing well, meaning it's not dormant, whereas the St. Augustine is dormant. So the question you're asking is, should you use Celsius to control the cool season grass within your St. Augustine? My answer would be yes. Yes. So if you're, the way to think about it is this, right? Like whenever you are trying to control a weed, like you, you want that weed to be actively growing. Kind of like whenever you're trying to feed your lawn, like fertilizing a dormant lawn has limited value versus fertilizing a actively growing lawn, you really see the benefits. Same thing when it comes to herbicides, right? So if you're trying to control actively growing weeds in your lawn, in this case, cool season grass is the weed, like you could use Celsius now, um, the dormancy of your St. Augustine really doesn't have any bearing. I mean, if anything, I mean, Celsius is not going to injure St. Augustine, but I mean, it, it, there's even less chance of you having a negative result against a St. Augustine um, with it being largely checked out. So to answer your question, yes, I would use Celsius to control the cool season grass that in this case is a weed within your St. Augustine lawn because that this time of year should be actively growing. So I uh, so hope that that helps. So something to keep in mind, guys, when it comes to, to post-emergent herbicides, you want, um, you know, what your what your lawn is doing, what your grass is doing, um, is less important than what the the weed you're trying to control is doing. If that makes sense, you know what I mean. So if you're, you know, if you're trying to control, for example, let's say you're trying to control crabgrass, right? But you're trying to control crabgrass in December with quinclorac. 
not gonna really do a whole lot because crabgrass doesn't typically go grow in December. But if you are trying to control, let's say for example, you had um, crabgrass growing, it's not a great example. Let's say you had crabgrass growing in your lawn in like April, but your lawn was still, were still dormant, right? The time to control that crabgrass is when it's young, when it's just starting to grow, when it's beginning to wake up and begin to, you know, wreak havoc in your lawn, that's when you want to take care of it. So the, the weed you're targeting, that is when you would, um, like you, you determine your herbicide application based on what you're trying to control when that, when that plant is actively growing, if it makes sense. Like I said earlier, another way of thinking about it is with your fertilizer, you really wouldn't fertilize a, dorm, a completely dormant, dormant lawn. I mean, you can, but you're not gonna really gonna get the benefits from it, right? Versus when your grass is actively growing, you get the benefits of applying your fertilizer. So herbicides, you can kind of think of them um, in, in a similar vein as far as when you get your, your best bang for the buck as far as, um, as far as results. Okay, so hope that helps, Aaron, a great question. Um, and then, and as far as you having St. Augustine, you, you already have cell, you said you already have Celsius. Um, the thing I would tell you that if you are going to use Celsius, that's something that's gonna help you get a better result with controlling, in this case, closest and grass, is to use surfactant. Um, I'm a huge proponent of using surfactant when you are spraying post emergent herbicides because it allows it, it helps it to spread more evenly or coat the leaf of the plant that you're trying to target and it helps it adhere to it better. So, you know, you mentioned using Celsius, which is a great, um, which is a great option, great idea, but then also using, um, adding some surfactant to the tank as well is an important step for getting a, um, for getting a good result, okay? So add some surfactant to the tank along with your, um, with your Celsius. All right, next up is T1000, is in the house. He says, happy Friday, happy Friday T1000. And uh, next up we have Mason RC saying, good evening, lawn care enthusiasts. Show Ron some love, hit the like button. Yeah, so Mason RC, I believe, is the gentleman that sent me the picture wearing the Greatness from the Ground Up shirt. So, you know, again, if you wanna look cool like this, I mean, first of all, the man's got a Georgia sticker on his lawnmower, so he's already got cool points. I mean, even if his lawnmower not looking that great, we'd have to call him pretty cool just for that, right? You gotta give him points for that. But if you wanna look like this, looking, you know, being able to flex and look pretty cool but with your lawn in the background and you want one of those shirts, you know, Rusty shows you guys what you could look like, what you could look like, or Mason's showing you what you could look like, you know, if you ask a great question and you happen to win one of the Greatness from the Ground Up shirts, right? All right, Eric T is in the house. He says, uh, prodiamine, let's see here. He says, prodiamine um, is 0.83 ounces per thousand square feet, and you put out uh, 0.80 in the early sprint. So you don't recommend to put prodiamine in the fall? No, I don't, um, uh, Eric. So yes, you're right. The, the full rate for prodiamine is 0.83 ounces per thousand square feet for warm season grasses, for most of them anyway. Uh, the reason why I use 0 0.80 in the videos and the content that I make is because it just makes the math easier. Like if I tell people, you know, to like 0.83 times four, it's it, like the, the math is just more complicated for most people than saying, you know, take 0.8, multiply it times four, you're gonna get 3.2 ounces. You know, you're pretty much there and that's gonna produce, um, you know, a good result as far as control. In the fall, I like to rotate to a different pre-emergent. So I use prodiamine in the springtime, which you saw in the video that was released last week or earlier, yeah, late last weekend. And in the fall, my pre-emergent of choice is a product called Spectacle Flow. So this is my, my jam for a pre-emergent in fall because it's just, in my opinion, it's the best for warm season grass. Does a great job against Poannua. And uh, that's why I, I use that. So prodiamine or dithiapir in the spring and then um, spectacle flow in the fall. If you have a cool season lawn, you could do, now you could, you'd you wanna, you're gonna wanna save, um, you want, you're, you're not gonna be able to use spectacle in the fall. So what you could do is you could use say dithiapir in the springtime and then do a split app of prodiamine in the fall, or you could do prodiamine in the springtime and do a couple apps of dithiapir in the fall. Uh, you don't have access to spectacle flow for cool season grass, but um, you know, if you're trying to control POA out of your lawn and keep weeds out of your lawn in a cool season lawn, um, you know, a couple of applications of a pre-emergent in the fall uh, makes a lot of sense. But to answer your question, yes, I do like one app at the higher end of the application rate in the spring or like this time of year, and that has worked well for me. There's people that do split apps and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just, you know, if I can just get by with doing one app, which again, I've done it for, for years now and it's worked well for me, um, I just save myself the headache of having to get out there and spray herbicides like in April, you know what I mean? So. And just whichever, whichever works better for you. It's really your call, which way you want to go. One app at the higher rate, um, I find is what produces results that I'm happy with. So, 
Hope that helps. Robert Rainey's in the house. He says, good evening all. What's going on, Robert? Robert, you gotta get pretty close to spraying out that, that lawn soon, man. You know, that, that ryegrass, we're getting, we're, we're moving up on the time frame here soon. It's, it's quickly approaching. Hope you're ready for it. Hope you're ready for it. All right, next up is T1000. He says, received my first soil test results of 2024. Any product recommendations to reduce calcium and pH? So for calcium, I, I honestly really wouldn't worry about it, T1000. Like I look at a lot of soil test results out of um, like say Texas, if you're in like San Antonio or mid-Texas, like it, there, there's the, the calcium, it, the calcium, the calcium, in the soil test results are um, are always high, or pretty much in all of mine that I see, they're 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 off, they're up there. Um, having said that, um, I've not I've not seen that really hold folks back from having a great lawn. You know, typically it's something in the macro. It's between it's between the pH, the macros, which are really important, and then your micros um, not being where they need to be to, that are holding you back from having a a great lawn. So calcium, I honestly really wouldn't uh, we really wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, you know, you're gonna want to avoid adding more if you can, uh, but um, but there's not really an easy way to reduce calcium in a vacuum without affecting everything else. And given that, I'm not sure where in the country you are, but if you say you're in Texas, um, you know, it's, it's you're, you're, you're not going to, it's not a battle you're really gonna win. And frankly, it's not one that's really worth fighting because again, it's not gonna hold you back from, um, from getting a great lawn. I'm finding the sulfate product that I, um, that I've shown folks that works that works well it's from Earth Science or Earth something. Uh, here we go. Yeah, this is it. Um, Earth Science Sulfur. So this is the this is the product if you want to lower your your pH. That I would say to go with. Um, I'm trying to find the big bag of it because they make a small bag and a big bag. Yeah, they have a 25 pound bag, which is the big bag. Uh, this is what I would say um, to use if your your pH is high and you're trying to to bring to bring that down. All right, so at T1000, uh, there you go. And um, uh, sulfur uh, to lower pH. All right, pH, there you go. And that's the, uh, that's the product, that's what you can go with. So hope that helps, sir. All right, uh, next up, let's see here on the gram. You guys are quiet, okay, looking good. Uh, next up, we got uh, No Name. He says, hey, Ron and fellow lawn enthusiasts, looking forward to some great lawn chat. Let's get those likes up. Yeah, guys, we got, you know, 135 people in the live stream, only 100 likes. That means there's at least 35 of you that have not hit the like button. Surely we can do better. So if you guys wouldn't mind hitting that like button ever so gently, really appreciate it. It's a free way to support the channel. And, uh, you know, sends good vibes to YouTube, get for folks to come over, and it costs you absolutely nothing. Think about it. How many things in life can you do that help somebody else out and it costs you absolutely nothing, right? All right, uh, next up is Koi Guy. He says, I have some dandelion dandelions coming up. What do you recommend? Uh, use a like a post-emergent herbicide. So like Celsius, um, most three ways will also knock out, knock out dandelion uh, Koi Guy. Um, yeah, just use a post-emergent herbicide that's correct for your grass type uh, to, get, to get rid of it. And that is what I would say to, um, to do. Lone Star is up next. He says, greetings, Ron. What's going on, um, Lone Star? Looks like you got Jamaican flag there. So if you're from the islands, what's up? Big up. And the next up is Cooper's dad. He says, ooh, this is a good one. He says, hey, Ron, any way you know of to deal with five compaction at five to six inch and deeper? Hmm. Have a section of the lawn I feel not doing as well and I feel that is responsible. Aeration is not deep enough and doesn't seem to help. Uh... I mean, so here's the thing, most aerators that you can rent, like the ones you get from the big box stores, you're right, the tines will go down, you know, three inches if you're if you're lucky, three, maybe four on a good day if you're lucky. Um, but if you call a service in that can bring in like one of the, um, like the like Toro makes the, uh, the it's called the Procore, like the, the heavy equipment, like that will that will get down to that level. So if you're looking to, to really, you know, if, if you're sure you got like five to six inches of compaction and using the core area that you can rent, you know, at, at like equipment rental places isn't doing it, you may have to call a service in um, that can bring in like a more a beefier aerator that will that will get down to five or six inches and that really should that really should do the trick. Something to consider too is if you're gonna go that route, um, Cooper's dad, after you go through the trouble of like doing like deeper aeration, like consider doing a top dressing, like to get like a nice sand soil, like a compost, compost and soil blend and, um, and you know, top dress on top of that, that's gonna help improve that soil profile and, and reduce the likelihood of compaction really returning 
um, going forward. So just something to consider. Uh, yeah, sorry you're dealing with that. Normally, uh, again, the aerator you can rent will do the trick, but in your case, sounds like you need some, uh, some heavier equipment. You can rent that stuff yourself, um, but it's um, they tend to be expensive. Like I, I looked into it one time with, um, I think it was a Jerry Pate company, and it was something like eight hundred dollars to for the weekend to rent it, and then you also had to buy the tines. So you, it's a, it's a, the cost of the equipment, and then the tines were like separate because there's different types of tines you can you can use in the, in the equipment to set it up depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So it's not an inexpensive proposition, and you might be better off you know finding a service that has one of those machines that can come out and uh, and do it for you. So hope that helps. Sorry you're dealing with that, but um, but yeah, at least you know you have a path going forward path going forward all right we got a super chat this one is from dornita lily thank you so much for the super chat i really do appreciate it super chat no Let's question but just a super chat thanks i'll take it thank you for the love and support i really do appreciate it all right next up we have shelby amos shelby amos is in the house it says ron i just sold my real mower say less why 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 do that? So I'll be using my Time Master at the lowest cut this year at just 1.75 inches, so taller. I feel like part of my soul was so I I feel it. It's not even not even my mower, and I'm 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 feeling it for you. He says I'll still dominate though. I agree. Here's the thing: yes, a real mower can produce results that look like this. Like you're not going to get a lawn that looks like that, nice and tight. You know, killer stripes. Um, you know, really without a real mower, you know, cut it, you know, in this case, it's like three quarters of an inch. Like you need a real mower to be able to produce that. Having said that, having said that, if you're doing all the other stuff I'm talking about, so you're taking care of weeds, fertilizing based on soil test results, and you're mowing regularly, and you're using a rotary mower, as long as you keep that rotary mower nice and sharp, you're still going to dominate it. You're still going to look better than your neighbors. Your lawn's going to be taller, but it's still going to look better than them because you know all the other stuff that goes into it, right? So rotary, yes, you, you, the height of cut's going to be higher but it can still look awesome. It's not like you must have a real mower to have a great looking lawn. You have to have a real mower if you want a lawn that's like three quarters of an inch and looks like a golf course fairway, but there's a lot of work that goes into that, right? Like there's a maintenance and there's the time commitment and then everything else. But I mean, to say, you know, I want a great lawn, like a real mower is not the absolute thing you must have. What I always tell people is, you know, get all the, the basis, all the foundational stuff right first, like get the lawn in good order, start out with like your rotary, get the lawn looking great. And if you decide, hey, you know what, I've got more time and I, I want to take it to the, to another level and I've got, again, you have the time to be able to do it, then real mowing, man. I mean, it's, it's um, there's a reason why it's the, you know, what's used on golf courses and a lot of professional sports turf, right? Because it produces really cool results. Like the lawn looks like a golf course, right? So, but there's no free lunch. It takes time and um, they tend to be more expensive. So there is that. All right, Sean Murphy's up next. He says, happy Friday, Ron. Just sent the GM 1000 out for a full service. I like it. That proactive maintenance is always a good thing. So it should get her back next week. Uh, can't wait to get the season underway. Nice, Sean. I like it, man. You're doing it right. You are doing it. You're doing it absolutely right, man. I get it. I get it. All right, next up, we have Dan Lynch in the house. He says, uh, hey, Ron. Poe a question. I've been spot spraying. You didn't give the rest of it, Dan. You kind of left me hanging. I, I was I was ready to dig into this question about Poa. And you're I'm trying to see if you, you left the rest of it down there. Um <laughs> all right. Well, it, ask your question later on, and if, if I find it, I will I will revisit it. Okay. So sorry about the question about Poa because I'm not sure what you're asking, but I'll do my best if I find it later on. All right, next up is Robert Wallace. He says, happy Friday, Ron. I was wondering, how many square feet does the yellow Super Sod top dress sack cover? Great question. So if it's the first time you're top dressing your lawn, Robert, I would say one bag per thousand square feet is the way I would go. So if it's the first time you're top dressing, one cubic yard per thousand square feet is um, what you're gonna wanna go with to get a good result. If you've been through a couple of rounds of top dressing, one of those bags will cover quite a bit more. You know, I'd even say you can take one bag and, and get like 2,000 square feet because you're not gonna be putting down quite as much material. You know, with subsequent top dressings, what you're really doing is you're cleaning up ruts in the lawn and that kind of thing. So I would just, um, I'd say it depends on where you are in your journey. If it's the first time, you know, plan for one cubic yard, per thousand square feet. If it's a subsequent top dressing, one one uh, one yellow bag will go quite a bit further. If you're looking to save some money on it, I'll post a link here in the chat that will save you guys an additional $5 on top of whatever incentive Superside happens to be running. And that code is gonna be good for all seasons. So um, just something, help you guys out a little bit. So uh, great question, Robert. 
you need anything else, uh, let me know. And I like it, man. You're already thinking about top dressing, huh? You're going, you're going hard on the lawn this year. I like it. I dig it. All right, so this is the link to um, the Super Side Level Mix. And they make a couple different products. They have, well, two really that you want to be concerned with. They have just their compost, which is a great product, but really what you want is their level mix, which is the 70% sand and 30% of their compost. That's what I would go with if you're going to be doing leveling work. And uh, Robert, this is a link to it, assuming you don't already have it. I kind of think you do, but in case you don't, uh, Robert Wallace uh, leveling mix. Uh, there you go. All right, so next up is G Free. He says in the house, he says, hey, Ron, Stripe Action Gang, happy Friday. What's going on, uh, Gary? Thanks for coming to hang out, sir. Appreciate you as always. And then uh, next up, we got two Trilla. Trilla from Vanilla saying, happy Friday, Ron, Stripe Action Gang. Looking forward to another great live stream. I'm gonna do my best, man. Hopefully you guys like the monologue at the beginning. Um, I just, you know, it's a, it's a question that... I get a lot this time of year, so now I figure I've got like a you know 20 minute segment that I can just clip out and say, hey, you wanna know my opinion of how you take a lawn from not, not great to looking really good? Watch this section, it's like 25, 30 minutes and it's well used to your time and you'll be able to set you on the right path to getting a great Santa turf grass. All right, Chantel says, happy Friday everyone. Like button hit, one show closer to the season, let's go. I, I like it, I like the enthusiasm. Uh, next up we have, is uh, Mooner Majid. Let's see here. Um, he says, I placed, uh, picked up some Anderson's um, professional golfs, the 19019 with barricade. Cool, so it's like a weed and feed, like a pre-emergent and a fertilizer, along with some spectacle flow. Cut the grass down, I am applying the granular pre-emergent followed by spectacle. Thoughts about this plan? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if you're asking me, uh, Manir. I, I would do, I would do one or the other. So if you're doing, barricade in the springtime, really that's all you should need. You know, I, would, I wouldn't I would like do barricade and then do spectacle right on top of that. Um, in my opinion, spectacle is really a better pre-emergent for the fall um, time frame. You can do it in the, use it in the spring, but what you might find, depending on the rates you use, you might find a slightly uh, slower, slightly delayed green up. So I would, if it were me, I would save spectacle flow for the fall and use the barricade product that you've already got for the spring. I mean, you really shouldn't need more than that uh, to, to keep, you know, to, to get the results you're looking for, which is keeping, you know, weeds at bay during the spring and summer months. So the uh, barricade now, yes, spectacle flow, save it for the fall if you're asking me what I would do. So I uh, so hope that helps. Um, I, I just, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't stack them. I mean, again, you can do what you want to do, but I, I don't, I don't think that um, that is the, the best way to go. And it's really not, not really necessary. You know, you don't have to do that to keep, to keep the weeds at bay. I mean, here's the thing, guys, you get, look, if you look at, my lawn, and granted, I've been at it for a while, but I applied pre-emergent one time in the spring. So like now, February, right? This year, my lawn will get top dressed, you know, knock on wood, my lawn will get top dressed. It's also gonna get core aerated. So you think about that. I, I've i already applied pre-emergent, and then I do practices, right, that, that are not the best for the pre-emergent barrier. So like May timeframe, I core aerate, which is literally knocking holes all throughout the lawn. Um, and I, I still, I've done this in years past, and I don't get a lot of breakthrough. You know, it's not like you, if you, if you do this, you're gonna have to, you're gonna, your lawn's gonna go from no weeds, so now you've got weeds everywhere if you decide to do that. Is it better to not core aerate after applying pre-emergent? Yes, you're gonna get, it's gonna, the coverage is gonna last for longer, um, but it's not like you're gonna go from you had no weeds to now your lawn looks like um, lawn looks like this because you core aerated after after applying pre immersion especially if you did it you know in the Mayish time frame a little bit later into the spring um, you really shouldn't have um, you really shouldn't have an adverse result so I say all that to say that I don't even do a split app of Prodiamine I just do one app and I don't get a lot of breakthrough in my lawn as far as weeds go right. Um, so you so you don't have to do barricade and then spectacle and you know you don't have to stack like multiple pre-emergence in the um, in the springtime to keep the weeds away. Like more is not is not better is what I'm trying to get to. You, know, you save the spectacle for the fall, use the barricade or dimension in the springtime and go on about your life. You know what I mean? You don't have to you don't have to overdo it. More is not always uh, better. More is not always better. All right. Uh, next up. We have a Chantel. 
She says, um, Ron, I know you speak often about spectacle flow for warm season grass where POA is a problem. How good as it again, how good is it against preventing other weeds? So in so I guess you're in Florida. Um, so Florida, spectacle flow with St. Augustine, I don't deal with POA much. Yeah, it's a great pre-emergent against other other weeds as well, too. I talk about it for POA primarily because that is um that's the thing that I, I care the most about about. But if you look at the label, it covers like a broad range of um of other weeds. I may. I'm not sure if I have, I can pull the label up here really quickly to show you. Um, ba, 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 ba. Um, let's see here, I may or may not. Yeah, so for example, I talk about Poe with Spectacle, right? But if you look, this is the the list. I don't even know if I have all of them on here, but as far as other weeds it takes care of, you know, Burnweed, Bittercress, Medic, um, Burn Clover. I mean, it's got an entire, you know, regular Clover, um, you know, it's, it, Covers a lot, a lot of weeds that um, that is it's not just spectacles. What I'm trying, it's not just um, Poe is what I'm trying to tell you. You know, it's a, it's an excellent pre-emergent that lasts a long time and it covers a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? So you get the sedges section, and I don't think I even put everything on here. Like if you look at the label, there's actually probably more than what I have here because it's, it's getting kind of long. And I'm like, you know, here's a good example of what it takes care of. So to answer your question, no, it's not just for Poa. That's what I care the most about when it comes to that. But if, but a good example, like I use Spectacle on my lawn. I don't have really any weeds, not just Poe annual. I don't have any weeds in my lawn. Like you guys have seen pictures of it dormant and it's just brown dormant stripes. There's no no green in it, right? So it's a, a great pre-emergent, not just for Poe annual. Um, next up is, uh, let's see here. Um, Gator Rube says, he says, can you... <laughs> can you mix pre-emergent and post-emergent together or will that cause a problem? You can, you can. So if you're asking, can you use, say, good example, say you're gonna use prodiamine, so you're trying to prevent weeds, but you've also got weeds in your lawn already. So say, let's use the example of a Bermuda lawn or a Zoysia lawn. You could mix, um, you could mix Celsius, you could mix Certainty along with your prodiamine app and spray them all at the same time. The only thing I would say is that if you decide to do that is you're gonna want to wait um, at least a day before running your irrigation to water the prodiamine in because post emergent herbicides, you spray them on the leaf of the plant and you allow them to dry. That's how they get taken up and that's how they work. So you would not wanna go spray Celsius and Certainty and then go run irrigation right afterwards. So you would spray them all and then um, wait at least a day and then run your irrigation uh, to water the pre-emergent in. The only other thing I would say that you can do, and it's something that I've done and I've, I've gotten good results with, is I would omit surfactant if you're spraying pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides at the same time. Uh, the reason for that is, if you think about it, prodiamine needs to get in the soil to work. Um, and I would I wanna say that, you know, if you're mixing them to save time, the, the pre-emergent is the thing you probably care the most about, right? Because that's the one that is most, um, that's most sensitive to timing. Like you can always go back and spray post-emergent herbicides again, but the pre-emergent, you wanna you wanna get that in the soil. Again, if you're in the spring, if, in, if you're doing the spring pre-emergent, it needs to be before the average soil temps are in the mid 50s. So you don't wanna do anything to hamper that from working well. And you know, using adding a sticker to it, a, like a, an agent that's gonna, gonna help the pre-emergent stick to the plant and make it like allow less of it to get in the soil is kind of working against yourself. So. The way you can do, still get a good result using pre and post emergent herbicides is to, you can absolutely spray them together. I've done that, it works great, um, but just you have to give it a, at least a day between the time when you spray that concoction, an example, Celsius Certainty Prodiamine, and when you water to, to put the Prodiamine into the uh, the soil profile. So hope that helps uh, Gator Room. It's not gonna mess anything up. And uh, yeah, you can absolutely do that if your goal is to um, is to save time. You know what I mean? I mean, the best bet, again, if you didn't ask this, but the best way of doing it would be to spray your pre-emergent separately and then spray your post-emergent separately because then you would use your facts along with it. But if you're like, you know what, I don't have time to do all that and I just want to um, just do one and done, you can mix them, you can spray them all together and it will um, it will work well. So, uh, so yes, you're not gonna mess anything up by doing that. All right, Brian Hall is here, he says, um, hey Ron, temperatures have plummeted here in Michigan since last week, you're, you're in Michigan, man, you guys are gonna, it's gonna be a while, you guys are not, you guys are not in the same program as we are here in the in the Southeast. These temperatures plummeted um, from 60 to 30, yikes, still waiting on spring 2024. Yeah, it's gonna be a minute, I mean, you guys are gonna be up and down, we're gonna still be up and down, but overall, it's trending warmer, you know what I mean? You guys are probably a month or so 
maybe six weeks, depending on where you are in Michigan behind us. So just give it, give it time, give it time, give it time. All right. Uh, next up we have um, Richard Taylor has a question. He says, my soil temperatures are right at 50 degrees now here in middle Tennessee. I asked you earlier this week about a split application since the temp is closed. Should I apply a uh, full dose or split? It's really your call. You will get, you can get a good result either way. If you want to do um, like a half rate now and do the other half in late March, early April, that would be fine too, Richard. Either one will produce a good result. The big thing is to apply your prodiamine. So getting an app out now when it's in, you know, 50 degrees, I think it's a great time. Your, your soil temps, I'm sure, uh, I imagine you're talking about, your soil temps are in the 50s or low 50s, great time to get your free immersion out. And if you want to do, like in your case of warm season grass, say you want to do like 0.4 ounces per thousand now, and then do another 0.4 in late March, April, that would work just fine too. Either way will work. I only do one because I only just I just don't want to make more work for myself in like March and April timeframe, but it's completely up to you which way you want to go. Either way will produce a, uh, a good result by, I mean, a benefit to doing the split application is that it can, it can extend your coverage, right? It can extend how long the uh, the pre-emergent works for. So say you're someone that you're really worried about, oh, you know, I want to core aerate my lawn, um, but I, you know, I'm going to go out in there, I'm going to be spraying pre-emergent and I don't want to mess up the barrier. So what you could do is you could do like a half rate now and then say you core aerate in like April, you could do that and then spray your pre-emergent, your second app right again, right after you do your core aeration. So that's that's another strategy that would work um, work well too. Again, I do not do that, but it's if you, that's something, that's one benefit that can you can have from from splitting it up. You know, so it's really, really your call as far as which way you um, you want to go. All right. Uh, next up is Dan Lynch. He says, uh, da, 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 da. he says, um, I've been using Celsius uncertainty for spot spraying. I'm getting, I'm still getting some POA popping up sporadically, but now my Bermuda is growing up. Is it still, or should I still continue to spray, or will I injure my young grass? Um, if you're spot spraying, I wouldn't be as concerned about it, uh, Dan. The thing you got to keep in mind too, right, is that kind of like what I said earlier in the live stream, that, that when it comes to keeping POA out of your lawn, it, the best bet is to not let it be there in the first place. And that's done in the fall with pre-emergent. Um, if you are all, if all you care about is POA annua, I would not use Celsius. All you really need is certainty. And again, the thing to keep in mind when it comes to using certainty for Poanua is the rate is quite a bit higher than what you use for sedges. So there's actually a section on the label that talks specifically about Poanua. So whereas like with sedges, you can use a rate of like 0.75 ounces per acre. So like two to three of the small scoops per acre, that will work well for, um, for set for sedges, like they'll clean them up Kalinga, no problem. But for Poanua, you got to be closer to one, 1 1.25 ounces per acre, all the way up to two ounces per acre. So what that equates to is between one large scoop to two large scoops um, per thousand square feet. So what I found produces a good result is one large scoop and then two, one or two small scoops. That's between that 1.25 and two ounce rate. And that uh, combined with surfactant will do a good job uh, cleaning up POA. If you're just doing spot spraying, I mean, again, I wouldn't be too concerned about um, injuring, um, injuring your lawn. Both that's a nice benefit about Celsius and certainty. They are more expensive herbicides, but the nice thing about them is, and there's not really any temperature restrictions and they are, they are nicer to the grasses that they're designed to be used on as far as, as nice as a herbicide can be anyway. Right. So I'd say, um, make sure you're using the correct rate and use surfactant, um, to, to get a good result if you're trying to control, uh, the Poanua. And again, if some of you guys are looking for certainty, here recently we added, I think I've got it here. Here recently we added a kit for that, if people that just, just want just like Poa control or just sedge control, if you look at certainty now, you can get just the bottle or you can get a kit that we have now that has certainty, marker dye, and surfactants. If all you're trying to do is control some Poanua in your lawn, you're like, I already got Celsius or I don't need Celsius, then you can either get the bottle or you can get the kit, which is gonna save you a bit of money and also you know, gives you everything you need to get a good result as far as controlling Poa in your lawn. So I uh, so hope that helps. And you can find those again under the weed control section on the golf course lawn store. All right, T1000 is up next. He says, I have Bermuda grass in Central Texas. Is it too soon to start turf raking? So here's the thing, uh, T1000. I mean, I, as far as preparing for my, my pre-emergent application, I use turf raking to do that. Like I haven't, I've, I've cut the lawn a couple of times this year already, but the most of the debris clean out 
came from the turf raking that I did in January. I think I sent you guys, I showed you guys like pictures of that. I showed you some video of that. So, um, so the answer to your question, no. If your goal is to, you know, if you're, you're trying to prepare for putting out a pre-emergent app, then and you want to use turf raking as a way to clean the debris out of the lawn in preparation for that, sure, that's no problem. If you're talking about turf raking as like a regular practice when the lawn is growing, yeah, it's too early. Because I mean, even in Central Texas, your lawn isn't, isn't out of dormancy yet. You're not mowing it regularly yet. Like I wouldn't be out there regularly turf raking now because there's not there's not a whole lot of reason to do it, right? Like you're gonna you're you're not cutting the grass regularly, so you're not throwing debris into the lawn. So there's not gonna be a whole lot to clean out of it. So if you're to, to recap, if you're doing it as part of preparing for a pre-emergent app, sure. But if you want to do it, if you're doing it like regularly now, I just don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. You, you're not gonna hurt anything, but I just don't know what you're really gonna get out of it, other than. I mean, you're going to have some really nice defined stripes in your lawn, but as far as like the benefits, I just don't really see um, see it this time of year for regularly for regularly doing that. You know, you see what I'm saying? So again, really your call. Um, I would wait until, like, say April time frame. Once the grass is woken up, you're regularly mowing it. Then you can start doing your turf raking. And again, when it comes to doing that, um, you don't want to be aggressive with it. So you know, I set up my my turf rake to where the tines never hit the soil. So like two to four millimeters, like two millimeters about as aggressive as you want to go just above the surface, you know, four millimeters is going to be fine too. But just above, you know, you want you want the, the rake to go into the grass, but not get to the point where you're you're in there scraping, you know, you're scraping the uh, the soil. So make sure you're setting it up properly if you decide to go that uh, that route. All right, so we got a super chat here. Let me go grab that really quick from Mr. Ben Raham. Thank you so much, Ben, for the super chat. Really appreciate all the love and support. Super chat received. He says, I'm in Georgia in your area. I may be late, just got at got out prodiamine today. No, you're fine, man. He says, looks like no rain next week. Do I need to water it in tomorrow? The prodiamine was put um, in the spray. Okay, it's liquid. So you put it out in a, in a spray form. Uh, so uh, Ben, I would run irrigation if you have it. So if you have a way to water the lawn, yes, I, I would do that. So you just applied it. If you have a way to water it in, I would. I would. You know, you can wait for it to rain, but I would water it in if you have a way to do that. Um, since you you put it out today, not too late at all. You still you're still good to go. Great question, and again, thank you for the uh, for the super chat. Appreciate all the um, love and support. All right, Ben, Rayham, and all right, good stuff. Good, good, good stuff. All right, so uh, now the hard part, guys. Always finding out where I left off. Right, always. Always fun after a um, after super checks. After, all right, there we go. All right, so Jackie Bear's in the house. He says, "Is I may or may or not may not be uh, lurking." Happy stream, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jackie. And then next up is Stephen Thompson. He says, "Ron, I put uh, down pre-emergent uh, on the first. We had two plus inches of rainfall a couple of times." I can still see some granulars. Should I mulch the next mow? Um, I can water, I can mow, water, then scalp at a later date and put down my second app. Okay, so you did your pre-emergent. You had two inches of rainfall. Okay, that's fine. I can still see some granulars. Should I mulch the next mow? What is, I guess, are you saying you just want to mulch the next mow because you just don't want to catch the clippings? It's up to you. Uh, and then I can water more and scalp later date and put on my second app. Yeah, it's it's fine. I don't know what mulching is. Um, yeah, I I, I I know I understand. You have you're saying you still see some of the prodiamine granules in the lawn and you don't want to pick them up by bagging. Yes, so that's fine. Yeah, if what you're that's what you're asking, Stephen. Yeah, no worries at all. You're still seeing some of the granules. You don't want to take a chance of picking them up. Then yeah, go ahead and, and mulch. No worries at all. And then yeah, you can. You can always you know, do a how to cut reset later on and uh, do another app. Yep. So I I I'm following you. I'm I'm catching what you're putting down. I get it. And your your strategy makes sense to me. You say I'm around 19,000 square feet and back is not irrigated, so I try to apply them before rain for that reason. Yeah. No worries, uh, Stephen. Yeah. What you what you've described makes a lot of sense. And yeah. No, uh, no worries at all with doing that. To your point, you don't want to take the chance of running, go, going out there and running a mower and you know potentially pulling up some of the the granules, the pre-emergent. So I, um, I completely get it. Yeah, no worries at all. Of the two, like throwing some debris in the lawn versus allowing the pre-emergent to work, I would say the pre-emergent is the more important of the two because the other thing we can always correct later, right? 
Okay, uh, next up is It's Me 2017. He says, hey, I want to send my soul test results, um, but basically NPK are all very low and wondering how many correct applications of FERT will correct the soil. Um, yeah, so if you want to send an email, if you want to email your soil test results, It's Me 2017, you can send them to ron at golfcourselon.com. I'll take a look at them. This is my email address right here, ron at golfcourselon.com. So send them to me and I'll take a look. Um, and as far as uh, what I would say to use, and then how many applications it's going to take. It varies. Every soil is uh, is different. So if all your macros are low, what I would say is you could go with something like uh, if you go to shop and then lawn fertilizer, like the complete fourteen seven fourteen. This would be a good choice to bring your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels up. Um, what I would say is this: is apply something like this for three months. You know what I mean? So say you start feeding the lawn next month, so March, April, May. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good timing. So you do it for like three months, March, April, May, and then at the end of May, at the end of May, so between the end of May and beginning of June when you would normally do your next app, uh, do a soil test, like pull cores then and see how the soil is changing. And then you can use that to decide whether you're just gonna continue with that throughout the rest of the season, or if you can switch away to something that does not contain phosphorus like Humic Max. So. I would say at least three apps, and then again, soil test. That's going to give you the data, and then from there on out, you would um, you can you can adjust accordingly. But if you want to send me an email with your soil test results, I will um, I'll take a look at them and I'll give you um, you know I'll I'll give you my my thoughts on what I would do uh, based on that. And again, yeah, ronaldgolfcourselon.com is where you can send it. Good stuff. And you said I'm looking here. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Send me the results. You said calcium is very high in North Texas. It's just Dallas. Like a case in point, couldn't made it up, right? So same thing I said, a lot, a lot of the soil test results that I look at for Texas have, um, like, you know, calcium is high, but yeah, nothing to really worry about. That's not going to hold you back from having a great looking lawn once we get the macros corrected. All right, Andre Taylor's up next. He says, hey, Ron, happy Friday. Smash that like button, everyone. Definitely, guys. If you guys are enjoying the show, we got 140 folks in here right now. If you guys are enjoying it, definitely hit the like button. It costs you absolutely nothing. It's a free way to support the uh, the channel, and I'd much appreciate it. We got a question here in the um, in the in Instagram. It says, "Hey Ron, Dallas Fort Worth area thoughts on bio advanced liquid uh, season long weed control with pre and post immersion. I have some rescue grass, maybe poa, and some broadleaf showing up in my St. Augustine and Bermuda." I'm not familiar with that product, um, T and Huntsman, to be able to tell you, you know, uh, how like I don't I don't know what the active ingredients in that are to be able to tell you um, how well that would um, that would work um, for controlling. I'd be surprised if it's going to have control against Poa annua for for Poa in warm season grass. You're really going to want to go with certainty um, for the other grasses. If you got some broad leaves in there, it you know the um, the I don't know. Again, I don't know what's in that concoction to be able to tell you like how well it would work or not. Um, so I, so I can't, I can't answer it for you. You know what I mean? For what I tell you is for warm season grass, for broad leaves, use Celsius. For um, for sedges and poannua, use Certainty. That combination takes care of most of the weeds that are common in um, in warm season grasses. I'm just not familiar with that product to be able to give you an answer. So sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. But um, if you want, look up, look at what the Here's what I would do. I would look at the product and it should tell you what the active ingredients are in it. Like it'll be, I don't know, it'll be a small, it'll be fine print. It'll be a small section with fine print on the bag. Normally the lower bottom, right, lower front, like it'll be the lower right or bottom of the bag or on the front or back, it'll, it'll be there. Um, and then look at what the active ingredients are. And then you can just Google, you can search what, what those active ingredients are, you know, designed to control. Like if it's got like say dicamba in it, you could look at like, you know, dicamba, what, like, what does dicamba control? And you can, you know, it gives you an idea of what, what kind of results you can expect to get out of a product like that. So I'm, again, not sorry, but I'm not more help, but that, that at least will set you on the right path as far as looking what the active ingredients are and then making a decision based on, uh, based on that. Good stuff. All right, G7 is up next. G7 Films, he says, hey, Ron, love your grass picks and videos. Can you show your flower beds? I don't really have flower beds. I have mulch beds. I have mulch beds and I've got like some, um, I've got some shrubs in the mulch beds, but as far as like flower beds, I don't really have flower beds. I'm lazy like that. I don't like, I like cut mowing grass. I like like the grass looking good, but as far as like all the other upkeep and stuff, I'm not, it's too much work, not, not, not my thing. 
Uh, so my mulch beds, uh, they're just mulch. Actually, if you wanna see what the mulch beds look like, uh, there is, I think a video that I shot last year, you'll be able to see how the mulch beds look. It's, I mean, I, I, can, I mean, it's a black mulch. It's, it's very, it's, it, I'll send you a video of it, but I, I just wanna set you up for disappointment. It's not gonna be exciting. It's not gonna be exciting, uh, but let's see. I think I've got, oh, I've got something here, yeah. So this one, the, this, uh, the video that I did on the organic weed control, that product from Miramichi Green, the concentrate, in that one, I use it to control spurge in the mulch beds and also some, um, some weeds that were growing through the street, like a crack in the sidewalk, or that's not true, a crack in the, like, the drainage area right in front of my lawn. Uh, so if you wanna see what the mulch beds look like, if you really wanna, you wanna be disappointed, I will, uh, I'll send you a, uh, this video here at G7 and you can see what I'm um, see what I'm working with. Uh, let's see, uh, mulch beds uh, in this video. Uh, but again, prepare to be highly, highly underwhelmed. It's not gonna be not gonna be impressive at all. The lawn looks way better than the mulch beds. But uh, you did ask. All right, next up is Kerry uh, Gun Three. Uh, Kerry Gun Three. He says. My St. Augustine is starting to green up. The season, I'm getting rid of Bermuda. Uh, I have recognition and fusillade. I'm ready to do battle this year. Nice, yeah, that, that's the combination to do it, man. I mean, it's gonna be, that product will be, um, recognition will be broadly available soon. So, um, you know, we've been told by um, by the, the manufacturer that it'll like, Mar late, like March, April timeframe is when it will, it'll be, it'll be available for broad, uh, you know, be able for, you'll be able to buy it easily. So if you want, to be able to get some recognition or fuse late or use our kit because we've got both here. If you go to shop and then go to Weed Killer um, and you will see there that recognition and fuse late herbicide kit is currently sold out. But if you go here and you click on notify when available, you will be among the very, actually you'll be the first to know because as soon as I set it um, available for sale, set it live, um, it's gonna send an email out to you guys and you'll be the literally the first runs before I send an email out blast out, before I post anything on YouTube, like the people that are on that list for both rec the kit and also for recognition by itself will be the very first ones to know you'll have first dibs at it. Um, I don't know how limited supply is gonna be when it actually is released, but um, but yeah, but yeah, what, you, what you've got is the combination for controlling Bermuda grass in St. Augustine and, uh, and Zoysia, which is pretty awesome. I mean, that's, that's, been, that's been practically impossible to easily do without injuring those grasses in years past. So really cool that uh, Syngenta, that Syngenta has come up with um, with a way for doing that. Like that that safener, um, camofin or whatever they call it in in the recognition is really, um, it makes Fuselay do what it do without hurting the grass, right? Which is kind of cool. All right, next up is Dennis Page. He says, what's the best product for hard packed clay soil? Money, not a problem. What I would say, Dennis, the best product is to is more not necessarily a product but a process so the best way to you know take a hard packed clay soil and make it less hard packed is to use core aeration like core aeration is literally going to be punching um you know holes in the soil profile or removing plugs that is going to help relieve a lot of that compaction that is the way i would go there are products that will that they call them like you know soil looseners or liquid aeration they don't replace like mechanical aeration. So if you, like, you buy your emission, money's not a problem. If you don't want to do it yourself, you can hire a service to come out and do it. And that will make a, a big difference in, um, in what you're seeing as far as the compaction issues in your, uh, in your lawn. So core aeration is what I would, um, is, is the way I would go. We also have a blog post on it, which I am looking for right now and I'll, I'll send that to you in case you want to see what's involved in the process it's really not difficult it's um it's just depending on i'll put you, just put you this way like actually aerating your lawn is not that hard the part that's more of a pain in the neck is going out and renting the aerator and bringing it home and you know unpacking it and washing it off and then doing the work and then you know taking it back so if that is not that big a deal to you like hey that's like no problem then you can honestly do it yourself. And you know, the thing is, one benefit to renting a piece of equipment and doing it is if you wanna make multiple passes to really beat up the lawn and really, you know, really get do a good job, you have the flexibility to do that. Whereas if you, you hire a service, I mean, they should do that. They should do multiple passes if they see that the, the soil is highly compacted. But if, you know, if you're someone of these people that wants to have a bit more control over the process, then, you know, that's one benefit I'd say of renting the equipment and doing it yourself. 
So if you're interested in learning out what it takes to core aerate, as well as some things you can do right after aeration that are gonna really help the uh, help the soil and then by extension your lawn, uh, you can check out this, uh, this blog post on the topic. It's in the bottom of the chat now, Dennis. So hope that helps. All right, next up we have, um, next up we got uh, Brad Larson. He says, um, hey Ron, just got my soil test results and notice my pH is routinely creeping up and now at seven. Ooh, shock, horror. Iron and sulfur are low. I saw a product called Dr. Iron that contains sulfur and iron only. Thoughts? Not familiar with the product, Brad, um, so I don't know how well it would work. It sounds like it's going to help raise your sulfur and iron, which is what you want. Um, and with your pH just being at seven, remember the, the Goldilocks zone is really, you know, like five, eight to like seven, two, somewhere in that space. Like that's, you know, really mid sixes which you're after. But if you're, you know, just at seven, just now approaching seven, you know, you could use a sulfate to help bring the, the, the pH levels down. I'm not familiar with that product to be able to tell you how well it would work. Um, so I, I can't say, yeah, you know, go with that. Uh, as far as a sulfur product that I've, that I've recommended that folks have, have then reported good results after, you know, it's going to be confirmed with soil testing afterwards. Uh, this is something that I could, I can share with you, but I've not used, um, uh, I've not used that product that you're talking about. I've never even heard of it to be able to know how well it, how well it works. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I would say if you're looking to lower your, uh, your soil pH. And as far as iron, there's tons of products. I mean, you can use granular fertilizers that have iron in them. If you are looking for a liquid product that has iron in it, if you go to golf course lawn store and go to a lawn fertilizer, you know, the, the complete 14714 and the stress product both have iron. Um, as far as liquids go, you have Nutrizolve, which is a micronutrient and that contains iron. Turfplex has some iron in it. So there's a uh, Bloomplex has iron in it. So a lot of these liquid fertilizer products have iron in them. So what I would say is use the sulfate to, to lower your pH and then use a, a targeted product to raise your iron levels if that's what you're trying to do. And the nice thing about this is you can use this in a spoon feeding program along with the, you know, the carbon kit and, and get a great result. So just really depends on which way you want to go about it. Um, Cause I've not, again, I've not heard of that product to be able to tell you how well it, it works or doesn't. So, all right, next up is Devin. I, I got your, e I see your message there. I'll check it out. I'll check the email out here after the show and I'll get you an answer. Uh, it's me. Uh, Devin's in the house. What's going on? He says, hey Ron, good turf talk. Once we get a Friday into Saturday that doesn't have snow, where I work, I have to work early on Saturday, you'll be the first to know. Can't wait to be back on the stream. Definitely, man. We got to have you back on here, man. I know it's been, it sounds like you've been having a crazy winter with a lot of, you know, not great weather, which is making you having to work uh, on Saturday. So I get it. You can't stay up too late. But you tell me, man. Send me a message. Send me a message on Instagram. Send me an email and I will, um, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. The folks want to have you back on here. And you said it will probably end up with 20 plus inches the past three weekends. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. That's a, that's a lot of snow. That's a lot of snow. Yeah, that's, we definitely don't want that in Georgia. So you can just keep that over there in Colorado where you are and we will just admire it from a distance. So, uh, but yeah, Devin, you're always welcome on. Just let me know whenever you, you know, you, your time permits and we will, we will make it happen. We'll make it happen. Sorry you're dealing with all that snow, but I'm, hey, you're out there working on the, on the golf course, which I know you love doing. So I'm sure you're still having fun at it anyways. <clears throat> all right, uh, Dornita Lily is up next. She says, um, hey, Ron, happy Friday. So I got your super chat. This is the question you had. Okay, I didn't, I didn't see it earlier. She says, hey, Ron, happy Friday. I'm going to apply prodiamine to Bermuda next week uh, to a weed infested lawn. Can I add in Celsius uncertainty at the higher rate to the tank with prodiamine? You can, you can, depends on what you're trying to control. Um, if you're trying to control POA, then yes, certainty at the higher rates makes sense. If you're trying to control broadleaf weeds, you don't necessarily have to apply Celsius at the higher rates. So it really depends on what you're going, trying to go after. Um, but to answer your question, yes, you can mix all those together. I've personally done it. It produces a good result. The only thing I would tell you, uh, Dornita, is if you're gonna go that route, I would omit surfactant and then also wait a day or so before running your irrigation to water the prodiamine in. But then outside of that, you'll get a, a good result with cleaning up the weeds in your lawn. So a uh, good question. Good question. And again, thank you for the super chat earlier. Apologies for not seeing this question. I didn't, I didn't see this right after your super chat. So apologies that it took me so long to get to it. But um, but uh, yes, at least hopefully the answer is uh, is what you were looking for as far as keeping or cleaning up the weeds by your own words, your weed infested, weed infested lawn. 
we invest in Lon. What you should find though is if you after you do that, you know, n going forward, you depending on how good a job it does, you may have to do another app to to clean up, you know, any little straggler weeds that are left around. But that really should put you in a good position to then when you as you begin feeding the lawn and mowing it to really you know get thing get things on the right path so the way the lawn looks now arguably is the worst it's going to look especially if going forward you start doing all the other things that we, i was discussing earlier um in the first part of the uh, of the show so good stuff archie amos is in the house he says evening young man looking forward to a great night of lawn talk man you are talking really fast tonight Got a date? LOL. No, I, I just tend to talk fast, man. It's something I, I, believe it or not, I actually speak slower now. When I was younger, it was, um, I think I've told you guys this before, but when I was younger, I used to have like, um, like a, like a speech impediment. I used to stutter a lot. Like, it, like, it's just, like it'd be hard to get words out. Um, so this is actually better. This is improved. Like Ron, I don't know, a long time ago, 30 plus years ago, this would be in, I, I again, I, I had a much, I spoke a lot faster than I do now. So I still speak quickly now, but it's, believe me, it's a lot better than it was when I was, um, a lot younger. So I'll be cognizant of that, Archie. Thank you so much for, um, for the notes, feedback. I will, I will try and slow down. You know what it is, Archie, is whenever I'm speaking slow, I feel like I'm like switching into Forrest Gump mode. Like I feel like I'm speaking, like I'm just, it's, I'm taking, I'm saying something and then I'm saying the next thing and it's just taking forever. And most people, when I talk to you, they say, no, that's, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly how it should be. But my brain, my, my mind, my brain works faster than, or my, my brain works faster than my mouth does. And I, I try to get my mouth to keep up and that's kind of a mistake. So I just need to, need to slow down. Thanks for letting me know. All right. TX Real Man is up next. He says, good evening, everyone. Love the Friday night lawn talk. Cool. Uh, Texas Real Man. I like it. I dig it. I'm glad you're getting some value out of it and enjoying it. Enjoying it. Uh, next up is uh, T1000. He says, thank you. I will get the earth science sulfur. I live in Austin, so not too far from San Antonio. Thanks again. You are very, very welcome, sir. All right. And then next up, we have a question here from um, Ben Kane. Says, let's go. When is everyone scalping this year? I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. I do the, the first week of March. That's the time to do it, uh, um, Ben. It's uh, that's That's an option. Uh, some folks will do a light scalp prior to putting out their pre-emergent. Some folks will wait till like what you're doing just to do it in March, but there's tons of different strategies for, um, for, for doing it. And again, the first part of March is not a bad, not a bad plan as far as, um, your scalping program. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not sure when the rest of the, the folks are, are doing it. And, uh, you know, it's a good point. Maybe, maybe we'll put a poll out and find out from the audience when they are scalping. It's a good, um, it's a good question. It's a good question, uh, Ben. Ben J. It's a good one as far as scalping. So yeah, so for those of you that are, that have warm season grass and where scalping is a thing, all the cool season folks are gonna be like, I don't want to scalp, man. I don't want time for all that. It seems like too much work. Y'all are crazy. You cut your grass down to nothing. Why would you do that? That makes no sense. But we can ask, um, when are you scalping? Uh, man, um, uh, we'll let me do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't plan to uh we'll say already done and then um in march how about that so we'll I'll start this poll uh that you got you got your different options so when do you scalp in your lawn do you plan to you already did it or you plan to do it in march kind of like what he was asking so let's see what you folks are i I'm, I'm, a lot of you folks are probably gonna be over here and be like man i'm already done march <laughs> It's just how you're raised, man. I got February time frame. Let's go. All right. And next up, we have Theodore Nobles. He says, uh, what's what's good, Ron? What's the best way to rid uh, Bermuda grass of patches of Bahia in St. Augustine? Thank you. Okay, so you have a Bermuda grass lawn. You're trying to get rid of Bahia and St. Augustine. Um... So what you could use is you could use a combination of Celsius, which will uh, target the Bahia grass, and you could use uh, Quinclorac for the St. Augustine grass. So it's gonna be like a blend. So the Quinclorac will do the St. Augustine, and then Celsius, like Bahia is the only warm season surf grass that, um, that Celsius is, is, um, well, is not safe to use on. So you could use that combination, and that your Bermuda will tolerate both of those well, but the Bahia and St. Augustine grass will not. So give that a shot. 
um, use some surfactant along with it for for best results, and then uh, report back to me as far as how you uh, how you get on. So yeah, it's a good question. That's that's a rare one. That's not one that I that I uh, you get you get too often. So um, so yeah, let me know how that works out for you, uh, Theodore. You got Bahia and you got and you got St. Augustine. Where what's your Bermuda grass been doing, man? It's got Bahia and and uh, and St. Augustine in it. I don't know. You have to put 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 a leash on the Bermuda grass. It's getting around too much, man. Getting all getting all kinds of crazy grass in there. All right, so far, let's see what folks are saying. Some folks are going to say in March, it's like in March is winning out. We'll, we'll let the poll run for a little bit longer, then we'll see when folks are planning to scalp. All right, uh, next up is uh, Jason Barbie. He says, hey, Ron, when is the best time to do a spring scalp? Most people will do it in March, uh, Jason. So it depends on where you are in the country, but March timeframe is a is a good time. You know, that's, what, and what scalping gets you, again, it's a great way to clean up a lot of the debris in the lawn, it will it gives the lawn a fresh reset. It allows the lawn to green up sooner. So yeah, March time frame. Um, there's a lot of folks that also do it now, right? So I've scalped my lawn when I as early as now, like mid February, and that produces a good result too. So anytime between now and into say mid March, if you're in the southeast, is I say is a good window to get your uh, your lawn scalp done. Um, but it just, it really depends on where you are in the country, how the temperatures are looking where you are, and um, and just wh whether you want to get out there and do it or not. There's a lot of folks that have already done theirs. So uh, it just it really depends on you. And if you want to find out what other folks are doing, you can watch the uh, the poll that's running right now as far as when folks are scalping their lawns. So far, it looks like March is winning out, but we'll, uh, we'll see. There'll be some folks that will say they've already done it, and probably some folks that will say, you know what, I'm not scalping at all. All right, um, and then Offroad Envy says, I didn't notice the fast talk. This is normal. <laughs> yeah, I, I, dude, I didn't tell you, I used, to, I used to be a lot faster than this. So, you know, I'm a work in progress. What can I say? Try my best. All right, Ryan Johnson is up next. He says, uh, can you help me identify this weed in my zoysia? Any recommendations on a product control? I emailed you a picture of it just now. I'll have to look, Ryan, and see if I can dig it up. Um, I don't see anything from, from you. Um, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm trying to, where is your, where is your, e okay, actually, let me see here. Yeah, I've got it. I've got an email from me. I'm not sure what that is. Um, you know, we can ask Google images. It's a broadleaf weed. It looks like, it's, it looks almost like clover. It looks almost like clover to me, but let me, let's ask, um, Let's, let's see here. I believe that it looks like clover. At any rate, in a zoysia lawn, Celsius should take care of that. Um, let me save the picture and I will, um, I'll take a quick look here and let you know what I think. Um, uh, yeah, I quant yeah, yeah, it looks like, cl yeah, it looks like clover. Yeah. Even this is saying that I think, I think so. It's, um, yeah, creeping ground crop looks, looks like looks like creeping Charlie or um, at, at any rate Celsius will do it. So let me show everyone the picture that you sent to me. Let me if I can get this up on this show. Mm. Okay, so I've got it right here. Cool. Yeah. So if you guys want to see the picture of what he's got in his lawn, um, creeping creeping same between creeping Charlie or um, yeah, I'm not sure if you have. I don't see any le any any white leaves in there, white flowers in it. So it's hard to say. But at any rate, the answer is still the same. Celsius. Should um to take care of that, uh, Ryan. Let me get it up here so all you folks can see. You guys can weigh in. That is what he um what he has in his lawn. And you see this in zoysia? I don't see a lot of zoysia, man. It looks like a like all like a big patch of weeds right there. I don't see a whole lot of zoysia in the in the grass. But at any rate, um again, Celsius Celsius surfactant will make quick work of it. So if you are if you don't have it, which I think you kind of do, but if you don't have Celsius, uh, um, Ryan, you can grab it um, on the golf course lawn store under the weed killer section. And we have a kit that has a surfactant in case you don't have that, which will save you time. And you can grab them both here at Ryan. And then there you go. All right, so hope that helps. Higgy Pop is up next. He says, um, hey Ron, happy Friday, great show. Traveling for business and will miss next few weeks. What do you mean, what do you mean you're going to miss the next few weeks? Why? You can't just, you can't carve out some time on a Friday night to come hang out, man. What's going on? No, I get it, man. Work, work first. I get it. So let's all hit the like button. It's free. It is free. Thank you so much, Higgy. I really do appreciate that. 
And then I have a question here, one that I messed, okay, that I missed earlier. Uh, let's see here. He says, it's from BM BGC says, Ron, do you typically keep the same stripe pattern with your real mower to further ingrain that stripe action? Multiple passes. Hoping continued progress this year will make me step up my game. Yes, yes. So I do, uh, yes, I do keep the same, I, I alternate which way I mow the lawn each time, but the stripes, I try to stay on the same one so they really get the stripes burnt in and have them looking good. So if you look at this picture, where is it? If you look at this picture here, right? Um, you can look and see, so what, if I mow the lawn lengthwise, which is kind of the way we're looking now, I will aim to, to make the passes on the same, on that same line um, each time. And, and when I'm coming the opposite direction. So yes, to answer your question, yes, I do. I vary the mowing pattern each time, but as far as where I do set the stripes, I go over the same ones each time to really get them defined and looking good. Same same thing applies whenever I turf rake or verticut. When I verticut, I verticut on the stripes. When I turf rake, I turf rake on, on the stripes to really get them to be nice and defined. So that's your, if that's the question you're asking, uh, yes. Do I do extra passes? No, I don't. Because I mow, I mow like every, you know, every couple of days. So there's not really, I don't really need to do a bunch of extra passes in a single mowing session. Now, like if, if it's like 4th of July and folks are going to be coming over and I want the lawn to look extra nice, then maybe the session right before that, I'll do a double cut. But for the most part, the stripes look good because they just, they're always, you know, every other time it gets mowed, they're getting set. So I don't really have to do multiple um, passes. And he says, what kind of cut will I aim for this year? Three quarters of an inch, man. I think three quarters of an inch is where I'm going to be. Um, I might start at five eighths and then go up to three quarters of an inch in like May. But um, but yeah, 0.75 is where I'm going to end up. So figure I might start at like 0.625, which is five eighths, and then move up to three quarters of an inch mainly because that's, and I think the lawn looks great there. Color looks good. Stripes look good. And uh, that is um, that is what I do. So it's up to you to, whether that works for you or not, but that's what I find works well for me. So I'm glad it's helpful. Hopefully, um, if you need anything else, uh, let me uh, let me know. Uh, let's see here. It's me. 2017 says a push mower at 0.75 inches versus a rotary mower, small yard at 1,000 square feet. Uh, the push reel mower um, every time and twice on Sunday. So you're gonna have a difficult time unless the lawn is is flat, very flat getting a rotary mower to do a good job at three quarters of an inch. Like you're gonna be very prone to scalping. Um, again, unless the lawn has already been leveled and it's flat, you're you're better off using a push reel mower at three quarters of an inch versus a rotary. That's That would be my, um, my, my, uh, my suggestion. Um, and the thing to keep in mind, it's me, you know, push rotor, push reel mower at a thousand square feet sounds like a lot, but believe it or not, man, if you know, I've got video from like way back when to, to prove it, if you go look at some of my really old content, like when this lawn was like 12,000 square feet before the fence got put up, I used to push reel mow the entire thing with a, like a, first I started out with a 16 inch uh, Scott's mower and then I upgraded, it got the 20 inch, you know, big time. And I used to push reel mow the entire thing with that mower. So a thousand square feet, I'm not going to have a whole lot of sympathy for you because that's that's not going to take you very long to to cut that with either a rotary or a real mower. But given that it's, it's only you're talking about like a 20 by 50 section on a very big area, you know, push real mower is what I would say because you think about it, you're not going to have to deal with gas. It's just um, you could be able to cut it lower. It's going to look better. So uh, yes, I would wholeheartedly say push real mower for a thousand square feet if your goal is to maintain a height of cut of three quarters of an inch. That is, uh, that's what I would say. And the nice thing about it, you know, when you having a smaller lawn, man, it doesn't take as much to keep it looking nice. That's the benefit for a smaller lawn. People are like, oh, say, oh, my lawn's not that big. Yeah. I mean, this looks nice. This is cool. It makes for a nice video and whatnot, but this is a lot of work. I mean, you know, this, I mean, granted, there's no trees or anything in it, but to cut the entire thing takes just eh, about 45 minutes or so with a powered reel mower. You know, a push reel mower, you can get out there and 15 minutes, cut the whole thing and be done. You can be out there and you're out and done in uh, in no time, no time at all. So, um, so yeah. Uh, Jared is up next. Jared George, he says, what's up, Ron? If I plan to top dress this year, should I do it before I start to use growth regulator, start using Primo? I only ask because I assume the grass would grow through quicker. How do I fill in the deep swells? Thanks. Yeah, so if you want the grass to recover faster from top dressing, then yes, wait to use Primo Max. So as far as growth regulator, 
um, wait to use this if you're wanting the launcher to grow in as quickly as possible. Um, as far as um, when I would top dress, if you're in the Southeast United States, late April, early May timeframe, and then you could introduce growth regulator right after that. I, having said that, I, I'll tell you that I, if you look at all the top dressing that I've done in the lawn in the past three or four years, the lawn has been under regulation every single time. So it's it's not like if you have the if you have primo in the in the plant, the lawn's not going to recover from top dressing. It's just going to take a little bit longer. So what I would say is this: if it's the very first time you're top dressing the lawn, absolutely stay away from growth regulator because you're you're going to tend to go a bit heavier the first time you do it. Um, with subsequent top dressings, when you're really just doing like some touch up work, you're filling in little ruts from like mowing and that kind of stuff, just like you know just this maintenance type work, you know the lawn will recover really quickly even if it's under. Our regulation. So, so hope that helps, uh, Jared. As far as for filling in the deep swells, depending on how deep they are, you may have to do multiple rounds of top dressing to, to get that covered. So I don't know how deep deep is. If it's like an inch, you could do it all in one go. If it's like four inches, you may have to do multiple rounds to, uh, to slowly build that up. So hope that helps, sir. That's a good question. And, uh, and yeah, growth regulator Primo is awesome. You're gonna, you're gonna, I mean, if you've never used Primo before, which I think you have, you're gonna love the results you um, you get with it. That is like a that's like the secret weapon for for maintaining an awesome lawn, especially if you're mowing if you're real mowing if you're mowing shorter. It's a uh, it's I'm a, it's almost it's mandatory, but it's 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 practically mandatory. It's a really important part of of um, of keeping your lawn looking good and being able to maintain it at shorter cutting heights. All right, uh, next up is um, Will Addington. He says, I've not researched it, but is there a way to tell if you have a fungus issue in dormant Bermuda? Um, I, I mean, I guess you could, but I mean, so here's the thing. Some of you guys, uh, I've, I've seen some folks have been asking this question, like if you have a dormant lawn and sometimes you'll see some like lighter areas in the, in the, in the dormant grass, if it's anything to worry about, the answer is no. There's nothing to, nothing to be concerned about. Sometimes, I mean, this year, not as much. I, I may have, I get maybe a spot or two of that, of that on my lawn when it's completely dormant. You know, Alex may get some on his lawn. And then as soon as you, you cut the grass, like you scalp it, and then it starts growing in, like that's not really a thing. So I, I, if you're talking about like some lightly colored areas of a dormant lawn, it's not something that I would really worry about. It's not something I would, I wouldn't go out and play a fungicide or anything like that. Just whenever you scalp it and the lawn starts growing, you'll be uh, you'll be good to go. Nothing to to be concerned about. All right, uh, Chantel is up next. She says, "Time to start saving for Spectacle Flow." Thanks for the feedback. Always appreciated. Yeah, it's a great product. And if you can find someone to split it with Chantel, you can you know that would be a way to to save on some of the cost of it because that one bottle covers a lot. You know, it's like it's I think it's like several acres, like three three acres maybe. Um, out of a bottle of spectacle, depending on the rate you're using, maybe more. Um, so you just, yeah, it, even if you could afford it, fi finding someone that needs something that you can split the cost with makes a lot of sense. So you can, you can go through it. Or otherwise you're going to have like, you know, years and years and years worth of the product. All right. Next up is Deadly Mantis says watching from New Zealand. Awesome. Aussie, uh, so not, not, um, Aussie, you're Kiwi, right? That's what people from New Zealand, you guys are, you're Kiwis and People from Australia are Aussie, so Kiwi, Aussie. I think, if I get it wrong, forgive me. This is summer almost at an end, prepping for an autumn mini renovation. That's true. We are going into spring, so you guys are going into fall slash and then winter after that. That's that's a cool Southern Hemisphere, right? Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Um, good stuff. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Appreciate you taking some time to come out and watch, uh, watch the content. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Tillman Water says, how much water does it take and how many times per week do you need to water? Depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about like when you're growing in new grass, um, every, you know, a couple times a day is what I would say. If you're talking about just regular watering for your lawn, like when it's growing, you know, an inch, an inch to an inch and a quarter per week, whenever the Bermuda is growing is what it, it typically needs to look good. And that water can come from your irrigation system or it can come from rainfall. So if you get rainfall, you don't need to run your irrigation system. And if you don't get any rain, then yes, you should run an irrigation cycle to water the grass. But in general, an inch or so of water per week is what uh, Bermuda grass needs to look to look nice. And you can adjust based on that. You know, if you get into the summer months, and it's getting a bit hotter, you may have to up your watering a little bit. So you can you can adjust that up or down depending on what your um, the, the turf is telling you. But um, but a good starting point is an inch of water per week. 
Uh, all right, so uh, next up we got uh, T1000. He says, gotcha, I will wait until April to start traveling. Yeah, I would, man. I mean, it, it depends on what you're after. I mean, if you just want to be the person with the with the most killer stripes in a dormant lawn, then yeah, knock yourself out and turf rake now if you want. But I mean, if it's like, as far as a lot of the benefits of turf raking, which is like managing debris levels and like setting really nice stripes and that kind of thing, like I, I there's not a whole lot of reason to do it now other than if you're just bored and you just want something to do. You know, there's not... That's not, I don't think there's a whole lot of benefit to um, to doing it this time of year, regularly anyway, but your call. Next up is Dalen Krause. Dalen Krause, he says, uh, evening, Ron, I'm on a budget. Wife, <laughs> I get it. He says, essential G versus a carbon kit. Which gives me the most benefit, short-term or long-term? Hope this makes sense. What's the best for the money if I only had to choose one? Wow, that's a tough one. Long-term benefit, essential G. Short-term, the carbon kit. Um, yeah. And uh, which one would I do? If I could only use one. Man, I don't know. Um, they're both good. They're both good, man. Uh, you know, I, I'd say this. If you're planning to go out and use, like, Primo and spray, um, if you're planning to spray and growth regulator on the lawn, you want to use the carbon kit, yeah, I could go that, but they're, but they're just different. It's not like you really can't say one or the other. Uh, you know, one is one is going to help build up the organic material and improve nutrient availability in the soil. Um, and the other one is like like direct infusion, infusion into the plant and also helps like your fertilizers that you mix with it and growth regulator that you mix with it. It allows that stuff to work better. So they're just, they're different. Uh, so short-term carbon kit, long-term essential G. It depends on which way you um, you might want to go. So here, here's what I would say: this I'll I'll meet you in the middle. What I say is, if you want to start out the season with like a heavy application of essential G, and then just do the carbon kit from there on out, that's that's a way. That's a, like a middle ground. That's something you could do. Like a, you start the season out like a heavy app of essential G, and by heavy I mean like 20 pounds per thousand, um, and then from there on out, just do carbon kit with your your spoon feeding program. That is how you could use both of them and get. You know, you, you start the season out right. Um, you're introducing plenty of good organic material to the soil um, with the essential G, and then you could use the carbon kit for as part of your regular feeding program. So that is how you could go about it. But really, once per month, essential G, and then carbon kit every two weeks when you're spraying your fertilizer and growth regulator is how I do it. So hope that helps, Dalen. That's kind of in the middle, right? It's kind of everything like in life is a negotiation. So you can tell wifey, hey, look, you know, I'm not, I can't do one or the other, but how about if I do like you know, more of one now, and then we do any more of, of the essential G for the rest of the growing season. And I just do the carbon kit after that. And she, she sounds, I'm sure she's reasonable. She'll probably meet you in the middle on that. She'll probably be okay with that, right? So I uh, so hope that helps, uh, Dalen. And if you need anything else, uh, let me let me know. You know, Dalen, actually, you know what? Hopefully the folks from Miramichi Green aren't watching this. We're going to do one more shirt because it's a good question about essential G and carbon kit and the reason the like how they work and the benefits between each one of them. So if you want, if you want um, to wear one of the very cool greatness from the ground up t-shirts, like one of these guys right here, um, send me an email saying, hey, it's Dalen from the live stream. I asked the question about essential G versus carbon kit and I want a free shirt. So, uh, so there you go. So that way, even if you're spraying either the carbon kit or you're putting on essential G, at least you'll be able to rock some swag from Miramichi Green. So you're repping either way. How's that? That will, um, that's, that's a good, that's a good meet in the middle, right? So, uh, so send me an email, ron at golfcourselawn.com. And I will, um, I'll tell you how you can pick one up. So my email address, in case you don't have it, it's pretty easy. My name, ron at golfcourselawn.com. And I will, um, I'll tell you how you can get your, uh, your shirt. And I'll make a note of that so I can know who I did so that Miramichi will be like, who are all these people you giving free shirts to, man? We said sparingly. You just like, you're getting too crazy with it. And too crazy. You have to cut you off. All right. Next up is the everyday life. He says, uh, hi, quick question. My Bermuda lawn is kind of thin, but it's on an area that has plenty of sunlight. Any idea what it could be? Uh, sure. So if you got plenty of sunlight and the other things that can cause it to be thin are lack of nutrient. So what I would say is if you've eliminated lack of sunlight as, a, as an issue, which is a common cause, 
get a soil test done. The one that I recommend and like are the ones from my soil. They're really easy to use. You'll get one of these, collect samples, send them out, and then within a week or so, you'll get your results. If you want to where you can pick up a soil test kit, I will put that in the chat for you right now, the everyday life. So that will um, that's what we look at first. We look at um, nutrient levels because you've already said getting plenty of, um, of sunlight. Um, the only other thing I think of outside of nutrient is if there's any kind of debris under the under the soil that could be preventing the grass from not doing well there. If the area is sloped, and um, so that means that rain doesn't like you know as far as like a water goes, like it, it's uh, like water doesn't really stay in that area, so the grass is also dry. That could cause it to be thin. But keep in mind too, this time of year, it's you know it's Bermuda's dormant for the most part, unless you're like you live in like South Florida. So um, so you know I'd say wait until it wakes up and then see how it's looking. In the meantime, get a soil test kit and you know figure out what nutrient deficiencies you've got in your in your lawn if in your soil if any, and then we can address that as the season as the season starts. But um, lack of water, lack of nutrient, sunlight is the big one. But you already said that's not it. So and you didn't say it was a sloped area or not. Um, but uh, but yeah. I'd, I'd say that let's let's look at it. let's get a soil test done and figure out if there's some kind of deficiency that's causing the um, the grass to be thin in that area. Keeping in mind that right now your Bermuda is going to be dormant, right? It's, it's probably not growing very very well this time of year. So just something to keep in mind as well. All right, uh, Colin is in the house. C Pims has entered the live stream. He says, "What's up, Ron? Joining a little late tonight. Front lawn renovation is getting underway tomorrow. Colin, please, please take pictures. Take pictures before, during, and after." Uh, for sure, man, because you're not going to be able to see how it looks after the fact. So definitely take pictures so we can you can share them with us. We can show everybody your cool Paspalum, um, you know, your Paspalum uh, um, renovation. And even better yet than pictures, video it. I know you're starting a YouTube channel, so video it, man. There's not a lot of Paspalum um, content on the on YouTube that I'm aware of. I haven't seen a whole lot of it. So you can fill that little niche, right? So if you got like a Paspalum lawn and you want to see what it takes to do a renovation, Colin, I'm your guy, right? You can you can be that person. So if you can get a camera out there, that would be good. Even if it's like your your iPhone or Android, whatever you happen to use, get it set up on a tripod, and you know you just film it, just just let it roll, and you can always do like voiceover afterwards, kind of narrating what you're doing, but just you want to capture it somehow, because it's kind of hard to go back after you've already done it to be able to film it, right? Uh, next up is Mark Houston. Mark Houston, he says. Uh, hey, Ron, I have zoysia lawn in eastern North Carolina. I overseeded with annual rye in the fall of 2022, but not the fall of 2023. I'm having an outbreak of rye now. What's the best way to handle this? Uh, to use a post-emergent herbicide. Um, so use um, like like cells, any, any of them, Celsius or um, Certainty will, will injure and or kill ryegrass um it's another option yeah th those are what i would use those one of those two along with surfactant is uh is the way that i would go to to get rid of that mark so sorry you're dealing with that it's funny you say that you know it's funny like folks will use annual ryegrass or even folks that do like perennial rye as part of their seeding projects that's more common than annual rye um they will uh, they'll they'll overseed in the fall that following spring they'll spray it out get rid of it and in the next fall it will, you know, some of it will come back, right? So even though you got rid of it, it doesn't, it doesn't really all go away normally in just one, uh, one app. So, um, which, in other words, what you're experiencing is not uncommon. Is just what I'm trying to tell you. But as far as um, herbicides, a warm season herbicide like Celsius or Certainty should do a good job of, of, uh, of controlling that. Make sure you use surfactant along with it for, um, for best results. And in case you don't have either of those, you can pick them up here. So, uh, help that. Hope that helps. Mark Houston, uh, there we go, herbicides. All right, good stuff. Uh, next up, we have T1000. He says, I always buy the clippings. However, when it rains heavy, my grass gets clumps of grass and debris. What can I do to prevent this? Uh, you gotta, so what I would say is this, if you, you bag your clippings, um, you know, you're still getting some grass clippings or debris in the lawn. And whenever you get a heavy rainfall, that's what's causing it to clump up. Um, if you can turf rake, if you have a way of doing that, that is, that's what will help you not have a lot of grass clippings whenever you get like heavy rainfall. Like that's what I started doing on my lawn again, a couple of years now. And it's made a huge difference. Like I used to get after every rainfall, there'd be like a huge section just covered in grass clippings. And that's not a thing anymore, really. 
ever since I started uh, regularly turf raking because that keeps that stuff out. So that's what I would say, a T1000. Even though you're bagging your clippings, some stuff still gets into the lawn and you have to, you have to get it out. You have to get it out. Uh, the other option is you could just do nothing and just get like a, if you have a leveling rake, a leveling rake is really good for breaking up that stuff. So if you got like, you know, the little zebra stripes or whatever you want to call them, like little like grass trains throughout the lawn, you can use a uh, leveling rake. That does a really good job of breaking it up and kind of dispersing them to where you don't see it as much anymore. So that's that's a way to get rid of them if you don't want to go through the, the, the headache of regularly turf raking to prevent the problem in the first place. All right, um, next up is Justin Judkins. He says, hey, Ron, I love the idea of biostimulants, uh, but for those of us balling on a budget, I get it, balling on a budget, how good results can we expect to see with the basics of pre-emergent fertilizer and PGR? Good, you can get pretty good results with that. You can. Uh, the, the nice thing about biostimulants is that you're, you, you get more out of the fertilizer. So the thing that I, I've seen ever since I started introducing like the Miramichi Biosimilance to my lawn care program is the color is better. I'm able to fertilize less and it's still, the lawn still looks great. Um, so it's, it definitely is better. The, the, the benefit of like granular biosimilance is it helps make the soil more efficient. Like the, the engine of the soil works better when you're introducing um, biosimilance to it. So that's, that's the benefit. Um, you can still get a great looking lawn with using pre emerger to help prevent weeds using a regular fertilizer application and growth regulator. Yeah, you can do that. The thing I'd say this, um, Justin, is if you're out there spraying growth regulator anyway, like most people, when they spray PGR, they spray, they, they mix some liquid fertilizer along with it. So why not like spray the carbon kit, like the 901C carbon kit? Because that mixes nicely with Primo. Um, you've, you're putting a nice biosimilant into the plant um, in the process. So it's, you know, when you're spraying, most people, very few people that I know spray PGR just by themselves. Normally they're looking, mixing a liquid fertilizer along with it. So I'm saying why not just do a liquid fertilizer that also is a biosimilant, which is what 901C is. So that is what I would, um, what I would say. But to answer your question, you could get a great lawn if you keep up with your fertilizer, your regular fertilizer applications, your growth regulator apps, and regular mowing. You didn't mention mowing, but that's really important. <laughs> Keep up with your mowing. That's you can have a great sand of grass. But again, if you're going to be spraying PGR, which is already kind of more of an advanced type thing, like most people don't know about growth regulator and don't don't really use it. If you're out there spraying growth regulator, why not put some 901C and NutriKelp in the tank along with it, and you know kill two birds with one stone? Like that stuff's not that expensive given uh, like the benefits that you get from it and how long and how far it goes. So you know if you it's something to consider, and you can get that here. So I would say get the carbon kit and get the 901C variant. So depending on how big your lawn is, either the 10,000 square foot one or the 5,000 square foot one. And because this is enough for, um, for it's designed for three months worth of applications. So it just really depends on which way you want to go about it, uh, Justin. So hope that helps, sir. If you're spraying Primo, you can be spraying Furt. So why not spray 901C? Next up is LJ, LJ. He says, is it okay to water in Prodiamine with Image? Yes, if, if memory serves me, Image is designed to be watered in. Like you're supposed to water Image in after applications. So if you are, that's part of the reason why, like in that that combination, that is like a um, a less expensive version of Spectacle, like with, um, ugh, which is Prodiamine, Simazine, and Image or Amazequin. Uh, that's why they they play nice together because they're all designed to be watered in after application. You know, so yes, can you water it in afterwards? Yes, you can. I'm pretty sure the labels um, tells you to do that. So uh, so yes, LJ. Timothy Gonzalez is up next. He says, um, "Hey Ron, you convinced me to not use glyphosate on my dormant Bermuda to kill off the fescue patches. Hallelujah." Bought Celsius, but it's still cold here in New Mexico. What would be a good temperature to spray that junk out? If the fescue is growing well, is, like is actively growing, Timothy, um, you can spray it now. So again, remember that the, the idea behind the herbicide is the weed that you're targeting, you want it to be actively growing. So in this case, you're using it to target fescue, which we're treating in this case, fescue as a weed, which is living its best life right now. So using Celsius with surfactant to go after the fescue would work fine now. You don't, you don't, in other words, you need to wait for the Bermuda to be growing to target the fescue. Because remember, the idea behind Celsius is that it's safe for Bermuda grass, like meaning you can spray it on actively growing Bermuda grass with little chance of injury. 
Um, but it doesn't require that Bermuda's like out of dormancy to work well. It requires that the weed that you're targeting is growing for it to work well, in which case right now it is, right? Which is fescue. So you can do it right now if you want to. Use surfactant along with it for best results. And um, yeah, happy days. Great question. If you need anything else, uh, let me know. Keep, let me know how it, uh, how it works out for you. All right, uh, Timothy, yeah, it's a good, and thank goodness, man. And it just, you know, as a as a PSA sidebar, like, thank goodness for not using glyphosate on your lawn, man. I'm telling you, it's it's one of those things that it seems like, like in springtime, when you have dead parts of your lawn, you'll be like, you know what, it really seemed like a good idea in February to use glyphosate on my lawn, but now that I've got like dead spots in here, wasn't a great plan. So it's one of those things where it only works if it works, and, you know, you could be looking at literally weeks, months of like your lawn having like big ouchy spots in it because you use glyphosate. And I, I personally just don't think it's worth it. So um, what you're doing is how I would go about it. And uh, yeah, good, uh, good job. You know, what? as a matter of fact, we're gonna clap it up for that. Yay for someone not using glyphosate on dormant Bermuda. All right, uh, next up we have Tillman Waters. He says, Ron, I overwatered and caused like sludge um, what is the amount of water needed? So less than that. I, I answered your question earlier, Tillman. So about an inch of water per week on, when the lawn is is, uh, is growing is, is good. Um, if you're at the point where you're causing like algae and those kinds of issues in the lawn, you're obviously doing it too much. So back it down, back it down a whole lot. You know, so um, so yeah, I've already answered the question around watering. So yeah, hopefully that, um, that helps you out. Okay, that Texan clips is up next. It says... Um, I'm in Austin area. Soil temps are about at 60 going up next week. Highs in the mid 80s. Lawns greening up good. No freezes in the forecast. Should I apply a fert like the stress blend? Uh, yeah, if the lawn's beginning to wake up and you're, you know, it's, it's still a touch early. Um, but if you're, if you have no freezes in the forecast and um, you're in the mid 80s already in Austin, that's, that's wild. Uh, yeah, yeah. So for me, I'm going to be doing my app in, um, uh, in March, the first part of March is when I'm going to be doing mine, but we're not, we don't have temperatures that are like what you're experiencing in uh, in Austin. So in your case, yeah, it would be, it'd be fine. Um, for me, it's going to be closer to the March timeframe before I do my first granular fertilizer app. So yeah, good question, uh, that Texan. And yay for you for having warmer weather this time of year, right? Good stuff. Hopefully you've already got your pre-emergent out. You didn't mention that, but I mean, if you're, if soil temps are already in the 60s, you're behind the curve. If you've not got your pre-emergent out yet, get your pre-emergent out. Uh, so yeah. Okay, next up is uh, Oliver. Oliver Ritam is in the house, who I think he's also in the, in the central part of the country, maybe Texas, Oklahoma area. He says, what's happening, Ron? Happy Friday. Had a week of temps in the 70s and 80s. Why can't we get that here in Georgia? What's going on with you guys in the Texas and Oklahoma area? He says, grass thought it was time to wake up. Tonight's temperature and tomorrow is going down to 27 to 30s. Yeah, so that's... There's still going to be ups and downs. So that's the thing, you know, um, that Texan, uh, Texas Clips guy. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you, even though you got temps in the 70s and 80s and it's, it's, it's happening now, it's still early in the season. Like I would be, I'd be highly shocked that if we're not going to get like what Oliver is describing, where you're going to still have some cold snaps here and there. I mean, they may not last long. They may not stick around for like a day or so, but um, it's still, it's still a touch early, you know, it's still a touch early. Maybe I want to wait till March if you can. Because I don't think all, I'm not sure if Oliver's in Texas. I think he might be Oklahoma, but, um, which is north, which is more north than where you are. But um, you know better than I do. Based on how your lawn looks, based on the forecast in your area, you can decide accordingly. If there's no more freezing, you know, weather in the forecast, and then you want to get out and, and the lawn is starting to green up and you're about to start mowing it and you want to use the stress tool 024, by all means proceed. I still think it's a touch early, but it's your call. All right, next up is um, DMARC416. He says, hello from South Florida. What's the deal with recognition? I can't find it anywhere and I can't control the wild Bermuda in my St. Augustine. Do you recommend anything other than glyphosate? What I would say, DMARC, is there's still time to control the Bermuda in your St. Augustine. Recognition will be available soon. I would wait for that. Um, recognition and Fusilate is a good combination for controlling um, Bermuda grass in St. Augustine grass. And honestly, you want the St. Augustine to be growing, be doing well, right? Because if you have any kind of slight sunning or any like light discoloration, you want the grass to be growing well so that it grows through that. Um, so to answer your question, I would not use glyphosate. No, I would not use glyphosate um, to eliminate Bermuda in your 
St. Augustine Lana because you're going to damage and or kill the, um, the St. Augustine in the process. Like, wait for recognition. It is worth the wait. Um, if you want to know where you can get, like, we're going we're gonna to be carrying it. So if you want to pick some up, um, just go here, go to shop, and then go to uh, Weed Killer. And then if you want the kit, you can go here and sign up here with uh, for the kit. And I'll, I'll just send you a link to that. And it literally, as soon as we have it, as soon as it comes in, we will, you'll be the first to know, you'll be able to grab it and um, be good to go. So you got the, the kit, or if you want just recognition, if you already had the Fusilade, you can go here and sign up um, there too. So I'll send you links to both of them. Um, and uh, yes, then, and that that is what I would do. Like, please, for the love of everything holy, do not spray glyphosate on your um, on your St. Augustine lawn. It's just, I, I don't think it's worth the risk. And I don't think it's really worth the risk as far as... Um, as far as a way to to try and control the Bermuda grass, you want you want to use something like Fusilade mixed with recognition to uh, to do the trick. So um, so go here, put your name on the list, and that way, literally as soon as we get it, you'll be among the first to know. And you can, you know, we ship stuff really quickly. So as soon as we get it, as soon as your order comes in, you know, unless it comes in like on a Sunday, it'll go out the same day. So um, you'll there. So there you go. There's the recognition by itself, and then there is the kit which con contains recognition Fusilade. Surfactant and marker dye. So depending on which, depending on which one is, is your jam, go there, put your name down, and literally as soon as we have it, you're gonna have it. So uh, so yeah, do not use glyphosate, please. Do not use glyphosate on your St. Augustine grass. There's still plenty of time to control the Bermuda in your St. Augustine. I know it's looking ugly now, and you're, you're hating it, but there's still plenty of time to do it. Even if you have to wait till like late March, early April to do it, there's still gonna be plenty of time to get it under control throughout this season, and you're gonna do it in a way that's not gonna kill your St. Augustine in the process. So please wait, go there, sign up, Add your name to drop your email in there, and you'll again you'll be among the first to know as soon as we uh, we have it in. All right. So next up, we have uh, Oliver uh, Rittum. He says, uh, "Question: Is it effective to get samples from the trouble areas of the lawn or just random sections? It depends on what you're after. Yeah, if you have areas of the lawn that are are troubled spots, and you want to see if there's something specific there, then yes, absolutely, get a soil test." that has cores from just that section of the lawn. And yeah, that will tell you exactly what's going on in that area. You know, if, if the rest of the lawn is looking really good, but you have just one area that's not doing well and you can't tell whether, like it's getting adequate sunlight, it's checking all the boxes, right? There's getting adequate sunlight. As far as you can tell, the nutrients should be okay. It's getting enough water. Like there's not like a piece of plywood under the, under the lawn. Then yeah, I would get a soil test that's just that problem area and that's gonna let you know what's going on there and you can address it accordingly, Oliver. So, uh, so yes, uh, absolutely. And then once you have, once you have corrected the problem, then you could, so say you, you check the area that is, um, that's lagging behind, that's having, having the issue, right? And you've got like, it's got some kind of a, some kind of nutrient deficiency. You amend that area, you know, you, you, you do a targeted treatment for that area to kind of bring the levels back up and get, every, get everything is looking good. Once that area starts responding and it starts looking, it's looking like the rest of the lawn, then you can go back to collecting cores for the entire property um, and just use one soil test for everything. You know, that's kind of representative of the entire lawn, but for just that one spot, it makes sense to, um, to isolate it and figure out if there's something specific uh, going on there. Like I've had people that have done that, that have, that have um, that, for the first time they do a soil test, they will do like one for the front lawn and one for the back lawn just to see if there's any differences and then adjust accordingly. And then they'll just go to one that represents both the back and front. So it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. In your case, using one just for that area, I think is a good idea. That makes that makes a lot of sense to me. Your logic, your logic is sound. Uh, JB is in the house. He says, I do a soil test in February, granular fertilizer every two weeks based on the soil test. Last, I cut at half an inch with my Toro Greensmaster 1600. This seems to get great results. I like it, Jay. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Uh, Drew's Lawn Care says, hey, I'm Drew. I'm 15 in Austin area. Soil temps are about 60 and going up next week. Highs in the mid 80s. Greening up good. No freezes in the forecast. <laughs> Are you related to um, the other guy, the tech, other guy from Texas who was saying the, who asked the exact same question, Drew's lawn care? Should I apply for like the stress blend? If there are, if there are no, if there's no cold weather in the forecast and you're already starting to mow the lawn, meaning the grass is beginning to wake up and you want to use a fertilizer like the stress blend, sure. Yeah, I'm, I would not be opposed to that. 
what you guys are experiencing is not what we have here in Georgia. So for me, it's gonna be closer to March timeframe. I mean, like I'm, I guess two weeks behind you guys. But uh, again, you know what the lawn in your area looks like, how the, the turf is responding in your area, what the forecast looks like in your area, and then based on that, you could feed, you should feed the lawn accordingly. So yeah, if if everything that you're saying checks out, then by all means, go for it. And good on you, man. That's cool. 15 years old, and you got your own lawn care program, your own lawn care, I guess, company. It's pretty cool. Nice. I like I like to see that. Young folks that are out, you know, you know, running those, you know, start being being like an entrepreneur and getting out there, getting the exercise, mowing lawns and stuff. Good stuff. I like it, Drew. So keep it up. Keep going. Uh, next up is Alfredo Martinez. He says, when would you plan to spread your insecticides? Great question, Alfredo. So the time when I will do um, a Celeprin is late March, early April. That's what I like to do my um, my insecticide app. So the insecticide that I use is this guy here, which is a Celeprin. It controls grubs. I mean, you don't have to worry about army worms really in this, this, earlier in the in the season, but it controls grubs, bill bugs. I mean, um, annual bluegrass weevils. You think about the common lawn damaging insects. Um, this guy will take care of it. And the nice thing is, it does that without um, with much less likelihood of causing harm to pollinators like bees or invertebrates like earthworms. So, uh, Acelaprin is what I like to use. Great product. I will apply it in, um, like I said, late March, early April timeframe. So, uh, so yeah. That is what I like to use, and if you um, you want to know where you can pick that up, I'll show you really quick, Alfredo. I'll send you a link to it as well. If you go to the Golf Course Lawn Store, you go to Shop, and then go to Fungicide and Insecticide, and you will see a Celeprin available in a granular form, if you like granular, and you will see it in a suspension concentrate. Um, so it just depends on which way you want to go. Both of them work well. They both cover about the same area, so it really depends on your preference. And again, late March, early April is when I like to get mine down. So at Alfredo, and that's where you can find uh, the insecticide that I'm talking about. Colin says, I will absolutely be filming it for sure. It's mainly just all prep work before the pass pullum is ready and in season, most likely when we till April, May timeframe, just getting an early start on it. Yeah, people still want to see it, man. You understand, Here's, dude, there are YouTube channels where people will literally watch someone mow a lawn for like hours. So, I mean, you are, you know, you, you doing your prep work to get ready to do a lawn renovation. Believe me, some folks are gonna watch it. Don't don't sell yourself short. Do not sell yourself short. Definitely film it so you'll have it. And uh, and if anything, you'll have the B-roll to where you can use it over and over in future videos. So yeah, if, if for no other reason than that, film it. All right, Mark Romano says, um, likes for free advice. <laughs> Thanks for that, Mark. Yeah, if you guys are enjoying the content, Please hit the like button if you've not done so as yet. You know, guys, we are two hours in, two and a half hours in. Let's find out what folks are saying as far as the poll on when they plan to scalp their lawn. We'll end the poll now, take a look at it. Let's see here. Uh, poll pops up. Um, so 51% of you say they're planning to scalp in March. So that's the majority. 25% uh, say I don't plan to, I'm not scalping. So either you have cool season grass or you just don't want to scalp your lawn. I get it. And then 22%, the overachievers of the group, say um, it's already done. So um, it, what, what I saw here is about what I expected. That March timeframe is when most people do it. But again, nothing wrong if you're in the Southeast from getting your scalp in now, which is representative of that 22% group. So very cool. All right, Joe Cox is up next. He says, uh, good evening. I want to do a reseed or uh, sorry, which is Joe Cox is up next. He says, good evening. If I want to do a reseed, do I need to hold off on pre-emergent? Yes. I applied post-emergent back in the fall. I can tell it worked because my lawn is only brawn lawn in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, all right. I guess you maybe I'm not sure what I'm not sure what kind of grass you have or what post what you said post-emergent herbicide you did. But um the long short of answering your question is if you plan to seed your lawn or do any kind of renovation work that involves growing grass from seed, you would not use pre-emergent. You'd be working against yourself. So um, so yeah, don't use pre-emergent. If you're planning on uh, on doing a renovation project this spring that involves growing your grass from seed. Uh, let's see here. He says, um, Jesse Rangel says, hey Ron, Jesse here from North Texas and new to your channel. Welcome. He says, my question is, can I apply Katana herbicide to kill perennial ryegrass in my Bermuda lawn and can it be mixed together with Prodiamine? Yeah, so Katana is another one that folks will use for controlling uh, ryegrass or spraying out ryegrass in a overseeded Bermuda lawn. Can you mix it with Prodiamine? You should be able to. I've never personally tested that. I don't, I can't see a reason why it would not work. So here's what I would suggest. 
get like a mason jar, do a, what's called a jar test. So get a small amount of prodiamine, a little bit of katana, um, you know, some obviously water, get them, mix them together, get them suspended, make sure nothing weird happens. I don't foresee there being any kind of weird interactions. Um, if it passes that, then yeah, you, sh you should be able to mix it along with your prodiamine and uh, get rid of the perennial ryegrass in your Bermuda. I guess one question I would say, Jesse, is that, you know, most people that get rid of ryegrass in Bermuda tend to do it like in March timeframe. And like the time for you to get your well, I guess if you're, if you're waiting for, yeah, if you can do your pre-emergent in North Texas, I guess that would be, that'd be fine too. But again, but normally is what I'm trying to say is that pre, the pre-emergent timing is normally um, before when you would get rid of the ryegrass in an overseeded Bermuda lawn. But if you're, if you're in North Texas, maybe it's a little bit cooler and you just want to do them in one go. But to answer your question, yes, it should be fine. Test it to make sure there's no weird interactions. And uh, yeah, should be good to go. All right, we have a super chat. Let me get down here and grab that really quick. This one is from Mr. Chris Dada. Thank you so much, Chris. Super chat received. He says, after many seasons of trying to up my pH, I'm slightly over 7.15. What's the best result, the best action to reduce it quickly? So you were low and then you kind of overdid it with the line apps and now you're high. Uh, use a, sulf a sulfur, um, uh, Chris. Uh, so this right here, I've linked it in the chat a couple of times tonight, but I will because it's you, I will, um, I'll link it again. So Chris, uh, Dada, um, lower soil pH. Uh, this is what I would say to use like that. Go with that to, uh, to lower the soil pH. And again, thank you for the, uh, for the super chat. I appreciate all the, uh, all the support. So you're funny, man. It was too low, went kind of heavy hands on the line maps and now it's too high. Always something, right? There's always something. All right, so next up we have, uh, we're, we're winding down here, we got Alfredo Martinez. He says, what to apply to discourage birds from tearing up my lawn? Huh. Um, I wake up in April and my entire lawn will have grass pulled up by all types of birds. Huh. So, okay, so if the birds, so what I would say is this, Alfredo, if the birds are going after grubs or other insects, use an insecticide. So I don't, I don't really have that problem on my lawn with birds like, like hanging out and making a big mess of it. So if there's if there's a food source there, like um, like grubs and other types of insects, then yeah, using insecticide like a celeprin should help with that. If they are going after the earthworms, you know, there's not you really don't want to get rid of those because earthworms are beneficial. Um, so particularly if it's after rainfall, because that's when the you'll tend to see earthworms more. Um, you, I would say live with it, but it sounds like you, based on your other question, which is around insecticide apps, I would say is late March, um, late March, early April, get your acelaprin application out and see if this year you see a reduction in the amount of birds that are in your lawn, like digging it up. Cause what they're doing is they're looking for food, right? They're looking for insects that they can eat. And acelaprin is an insecticide that takes care of, um, you know, most lawn damaging insects. So I would give that a go and see if you see an improvement this year, as far as the amount of um, the amount of damage, or, or as, as far as how much appeal your lawn has to the birds, right? Sorry, you're dealing with that, but I mean, there is a there are ways. There's a way forward. There is a way forward. You're very welcome, Chris. Uh, next up is Evergreen uh, Giant. Evergreen Giant. He says, "I live in Biloxi, Mississippi. When would be the ideal time to do an overseed project? I'm using a contractor mix." But overseed with what? Like, I mean, are you, or do you have a cool season lawn? And I guess Mississippi, I guess you could, if you're maybe, I'm not sure exactly where Biloxi is, but if you had a cool season lawn and you're trying to do, you're trying to thicken it up in the spring, um, then like March, April timeframe would be a good time to do the, do the overseed. If you have a warm season lawn, then I, I wouldn't really recommend it. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't overseed a warm season lawn with warm season grass in the springtime um, most people that overseed warm season lawns uh, tend to do it in the fall with like a perennial ryegrass as a way to keep the lawn green throughout the fall and winter. But um, you didn't tell me, you didn't tell me what kind of grass you have, what you're trying to accomplish. And I don't know what a contractor mix is, like what's in that. You know what I mean? So I'm sorry, I'm not more help. If you can, if you want to add a little more context, I can, we can revisit it, but I don't, you know, it's, it's hard to answer your question without knowing exactly what it is you're trying to, uh, to accomplish. All right, Matt Jackson is in the house. He says, hey, Ron, this is Matt Jackson from Austin. I sent you several videos of my lawn progress. Um, 
uh, with Soja. I can't wait until spring when I can send a video update. Cool, Matt. Yeah, nice, nice. I like it. I like it. And then Colin is up next. He says, actually, I do have a question. All right. He says, I actually have a question. I have uh, white grubs that are active in the soil in the front. Would you recommend attacking that ASAP? Yes, I would. Assuming, I'm assuming yes, especially when it's just bare soil. Yes, I would. And what I would use um, CPIMS is this. I would use a Celeprin. This is um, it's an excellent insecticide uh, that not only takes care of grubs, um, but you know, army worms, a bunch of other lawn damaging insects. This is ex exactly what I would uh, I would go with. So um, so again, I've already linked it in the chat, but I will send it again just for you, Colin, just for you, as far as um, as far as a good insecticide. This is what I would um, that's what I would go with. So yeah. Uh, let's see what else we got here. As far as questions, we got Jonathan uh, Cromardo. What? Uh, uh, okay, he says, a neighbor in central Oklahoma is wanting to put down pre-emergent on his Bermuda <laughs> slash crabgrass lawn. Is that, now, now, now Jonathan, is that nice? Was that called for? Are you gonna call the man's lawn, he's Bermuda slash crab, is that, that's not, that's not nice. That's not, you could have left the crabgrass part out. You really could have, but anyway. He says, he wants to put pre-emergent down his Bermuda slash crabgrass lawn. However, our soil temps are already past 55 degree mark about a week ago. Advice or a product for him? I would still apply pre-emergent. Even though you're a little bit past the ideal time, I would still apply it. You're still going to get some benefit from it. Um, I would still apply pre-emergent. Now, I'm assuming he doesn't want to grow crabgrass. If that's the case, what I would tell him to use or what I would suggest to him is to use dithiapyr instead of prodiamine. So go to the Gulf Force Lawn Store, go to shop and go to weed killer and then go for this, go for um, dimension, go for this, for this guy. If he's trying to, because in addition to this being a good pre-emergent and will also control young crabgrass because I'm guessing that he doesn't actually want that in his lawn. So, uh, so yes, Jonathan, even if you're a little bit behind the curve, I would still apply pre-emergent. It's again, you're not gonna get the, as, it's not gonna be as good as if you applied it at the ideal time, but it's still gonna be way better than not doing anything at all. You know, I mean, you know, up until, I don't know, I mean, maybe like mid-May, mid-May, you're probably not gonna get a whole lot of, out of pre-emergent, but like March, even April, applying pre-emergent, still better than not doing it at all. You know, you, you're still gonna get some benefits versus um, just letting, letting it just go, letting the lawn go and hoping for the best. So this is the uh, pre-emergent that I would recommend for your um, for your neighbor with his Bermuda <laughs> slash crabgrass lawn. Uh, you're mean, man. Why, how are you gonna call the man's you can call the man's lawn have crabgrass? That's not you know. <laughs> that's the problem with you guys. You, just, you get your lawn. Your lawn's all weed free. It's all like you know. I'm just Bermuda, and he's got you know. Like, like a salad bowl going on there. You're going to call the man's lawn half crab, grass, half Bermuda. At any rate, dimension is what I would say to use. That's what I would uh, I would go with. All right, uh, Mark Houston is up next. He says, for pre-emergent um, in Eastern North Carolina, uh, prodiamine dimension split up in early March, followed with a follow-up in April, May, or perhaps both in a split up. Okay, so to answer your question, Mark, uh, I would not do both. I would pick one or the other. And either one is, is really your call. If you want to do uh, Prodiamine, you can absolutely do that now and do another app in um, March. Um, so I, actually you said late April. So you want to do it in early March, then again in April. So yeah, if you want to do an application like now-ish is when I would do it personally, and then another one in late March, early April, that would be fine. And either one, Dimension or uh, or Barricade or, or Prodiamine will work well, either one of them. So um, So it's really your call. I would not do both. I would not do both. That that part I will tell you. It's really your call. The, the nice thing about dimension is that if you again, if you have any young crabgrass that's growing in your lawn, kind of doubt it this early in the season. But if you had that, then um, it has some some control against young crabgrass. So that's you know a feather in dimension's cap. And then you could again you could take what the um, the annual limit is for dimension and just split it into multiple applications and then do one now and again one in late March, early April time frame mark. So. Um, if you want to see your all your pre-emergent options, I've got you covered right here. So you'll be good to go. All right. <clears throat> Next up, we have um, a question from Brian Baldino. 
He says, um, a question. I live in Connecticut, want to put in a new lawn, about 600 square feet, it's small. It's all weeds and the soil is very visible at the surface. How should I get rid of the current lawn? Okay, so you're talking about like burning down the existing lawn and starting over. Uh, so in this case, this is where, this is a situation where glyphosate makes sense, right? You, I mean, you could use a selective herbicide, but why use a more expensive product for a lawn? We don't really care about anything in there, right? You're trying to kill it all off and then start over. So uh, so glyphosate would be a, a good option, uh, Brian. 600 square feet, that's pretty small. So what I would say is this, we have actually have a product I think would be good for you. So under the uh, weed killer for lawns section, we have a Roundup product. It's like Roundup Quick Pro that has uh, glyphosate and uh, it's also got, it's, it's a combination of glyphosate and diaquat, which is just good for what you're trying to do. And again, one of these packets, I believe covers around a thousand square feet. So it's a good it's good size based on what you are, you're after. So I'll, I'll link this for you here in the chat, uh, Brian. Again, given, if I understand correctly, given that you're trying to do a renovation, meaning you're trying to get rid of you know all plant life in the lawn now, you're gonna kill that off and then renovate with, you know, I guess sod or whatever you decide to go with to start the new lawn. Like this is a case where um, where glyphosate makes sense. So um, I'll send this to you here. And if you need anything else, uh, let me know. That would be a good fit for what you are, you're after. Great question. Take pictures too. Take pictures before, during, and after. So you'll be able to, you'll be able to have that. All right, next up is Tom Hoffenkamp. Tom is in the house. He says, uh, best wishes for patience, y'all. Season is so close. I'm sure it's driving everyone crazy. Thanks, Ron, for all you do. You are the best. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. And again, thank you again for last week for that typo that you found um, in the one blog post. So I, I really appreciate you letting me know that. So um, so again, yeah, yeah, we're close, man. We're, we are, you know, we're, we're about to get going. You know, mowers are getting all sharpened up. Everyone's getting good to go. You know, people are getting a pre-immersion out. We are about to be go time. It's exciting. Exciting time of year. Exciting, exciting time of year. All right, we have a um, a question or a comment here from on Instagram. It says, um, happy Friday, pre-emergent went down last Saturday before we got half an inch of rain. That is perfect, that's awesome. Going to start working the lawn down next week as temps rise into the 70s, very cool. Yeah, nice, I like it. So it worked out well for you. You got your pre-emergent out, you got some rainfall to water it in, happy days. And now you're gonna start slowly working the height of cut down to where you want it to be, that's cool. Um, Jonathan says, Jonathan's doubling down. He says, um, uh, let's see here. Um, I'll come back to your question, Jason. I'll be right there. He says, uh, no meanness intended on the Bermuda slash crabgrass lawn, just for clear context of the situation. <laughs> Thank you, Dithiapir, it is. <laughs> I hear you, Jonathan, I got you. Okay, and then next up we have uh, Jason Sewell. He is here in, uh, the house, um, he says, happy Friday, Ron. Um, I don't have a question, but I saw you missed a question from Drew Lawn about Celsius. I'm curious about the answer. Oh, uh, what was the question I missed? So Drew, if I missed your, your question, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go, yep, here we go, here we go, yep, I see it here. That's what happens whenever I get a super chat and I miss. So apologies, Drew, let me come back here and I will get it. Thank you for letting me know, uh, uh, Jason. Okay, so Drew's question, he says, I've heard you can only use Celsius twice a year. Is that true? And is there a limit on certainty? Yeah, so it's not true that you can only use Celsius twice a year. There's a there's an annual limit to um, to all herbicides. Pretty much the label for all of them, there will, there will be that. So depending on how much Celsius you can use is based on the rate that you're spraying it at. So the, the label, if memory serves me, it has like a low, a medium, and a high rate. Um, and then based on how you're spray, what, what you're spraying and if you're and how you're using it, um, that will dictate how many times per year you can use the uh, the product. Is there an annual limit on certainty? I I believe so. Pretty much every herbicide is going to have an annual limit of how much they'll say like don't exceed this much of the active ingredient in a year. I don't recall what it happens to be for for certainty. I don't recall what it is for Celsius, but um, but yeah, pretty much all herbicides are going to say don't use more than this amount of the active ingredient in any uh, 12 month uh, period. So yes, um, there's there's that. So depending on the rate, if you spray, like if you're gonna do a blanket spray at the high rate, you probably couldn't get by with more than, I don't know if you can spray that twice in a year. You might not be able to do it twice in a year. I have to check the label to, uh, to see. But the, the nice thing about Celsius is that if you went out at the high rate, um, that's gonna do a really good job cleaning up 
you know, the majority of the weeds in your lawn. And if you have to then go back and spot spray to certain areas at lower rates, that'll be, that'll be just fine. So sorry, I missed your question. It's a great question. And uh, Jason, thank you for, um, for letting me know, because again, whenever I scroll back and forth between super chats, sometimes I miss, I miss questions that folks have, but, um, but yes, pretty, pretty much every herbicide that I can think of, there's going to be somewhere on the label, an annual limit saying don't exceed this amount of active ingredient, you know, in a, in a calendar year. So, um, so yes, and I'm sure Celsius, I know Celsius has one and I imagine certainty is no different. I just don't recall what it is. Okay, uh, next we have, okay, so we had that and Jason, and that's, I think that's it guys. If you have any other, any questions here, any other comments, we are winding down. You guys are, um, are letting me off a little bit early tonight, which is kind of cool. All right, so Ryan Kirkendall is up next. He has a question. He says, um, hey Ron, um, I use the max annual rate for prodiamine in the fall. I'm planning to use Dithiapir for the spring. Should I use split apps early spring and mid summer? So what I would do, Ryan, if you're going to do the split application, I would do, I don't know where you are in the country, but let's say you are in Georgia, right? And you're going to use Dithiapir for your spring pre-emergent. I would do an application now and I would do the second application in like, like early April timeframe. That is when I would, I would go for that. I don't know where you are in the country. So maybe a little bit later in the season makes more sense for you. But, um, but what's what you're saying, uh, what you're saying, yes, going to the here, doing split apps makes sense. I would not wait all the way till midsummer to do another application of the because by midsummer, whatever weeds you're going to have on your lawn are already going to be going in anyway. So I would say early, you know, late winter, to um, early springtime is the, when you want to get your pre-emergent applications out. So good stuff. Great question. And um, hopefully that is a uh, useful. And again, I, I can't tell you exactly timing wise um, because I, you didn't tell me where you are in the, uh, in the country, but hopefully that makes, that makes sense to you as far as what I'm saying about, you know, not waiting till midsummer. I mean, that's, that's uh, that in my opinion, that's, that's, that's far too late. Like it's like pre-emergent, it's not going to do a whole lot for you. Um, then like what's like what's going to be going in is largely going to be already here by midsummer months. And then um, Dustin Waterman says, yep, always read the label. Don't take your buddy's word for it. That's it. That's exactly right. Always read the label, man. Always, always, always read the label. I mean, there's there's guidance on there for I mean, yeah, it's, it's there's guidance on there for what the herbicide will control. There's also tips for applying it properly. So for a good example, if you look at like, for example, I have a video on certainty, right? And that video was shot in the summertime when I was using it to control sedges. So the rate for certainty for sedges is quite a bit lower than the rate for certainty if you're trying to control poannua. So if you just watch that video blindly and you're trying to use certainty this time of year to control sedges and you use, sorry, to control poannua and you use the rates that you saw me use in that video, you wouldn't get a good result. But if you look, she actually read the label for certainty. There's a section literally spelled out for poannua where it says, hey, if you got poa in your lawn, got to bump the rate up. And this is what we recommend for good control. So to Dustin's point, reading the label is important. There's always going to be guidance on there around safety, like the kind of PPE you need to be wearing, and also around just tips for getting a good result using the product, right? So that's a, that's a good advice. Good advice on using the label, on reading the label. And then Andre is up next. He says, on a budget, would you rotary mow and then manual real mow afterwards or does that go against each other? I don't understand how that helps on a budget, Andre. Um, so would you rotary mow and then manual real mow afterwards, or does that go against? Not if they don't work against each other. Um, I guess if you're asking, I'm not sure what you're asking. I guess you're asking, you could you rotary mow and then follow it up with a real mow? Um I mean, it's not, it's not a good for your time. Like if you're trying to budget your time, you're just, you're spending twice as much time to do that. What I would say is this, if you're trying to do a scalp at the beginning of the season and then you're trying to make a major like height of cut change, then yeah, using your rotary mower for that is a good idea. But then if you want to real mow, just use the manual real mower. Like, I don't know what you really get from using the, I'm, I'm talking about when the lawn is actively growing and you're like, you're in the season, you're regularly mowing it. I don't know what you get by using, by running a the rotary mower over the lawn first and then going it on it afterwards with the real mower, unless you're letting the lawn get long between mowings. So say you're only mowing your lawn once every couple of weeks. 
and you want to use the rotary to bring it down a little bit and then use the manual, I guess, but the lawn's not going to look very good doing that. You know what I mean? It's, you're going to have like areas of the lawn that are discolored by doing that. So I, so I guess my answer is going to be, my answer is going to be no, they, they will not work against each other. I would pick one mower or the other and just use that is what I would say. Like if you want a real mow it, use the manual real mower. If you want a rotary mower, it, use the, 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 um, the rotary mower. I would not rotary mow the lawn and then go right back afterwards and then real mow it because I don't know what you really would get out of that. Um, I don't know what you would really get out of that. That and I guess I don't know what you would get out of that. That's that you're not going to already get from just manually real mo just just real mowing it. You know what I mean? Like you could say that oh I I rotary mowed it and then I came back with the real mower for like even a better cut, but you could still accomplish that with just mowing it in the first place with the real mower. You know what I mean? So I I don't um, so no I would say this I would not you're not working against yourself, but I don't know that you're really getting anything by using both mowers to mow the lawn each time you mow it. If I'm understanding your question properly. So if, I, if I'm not, I apologize, but I, I, I think I am. And the answer still stands. I would not do that. And uh, let's see here. Um, Alfredo uh, Martinez says, will I damage my dormant grass if I spray 30% white vinegar on mature weeds? Uh, less likely to do damage than, say, glyphosate will do. But um, but again, like like vinegar is... it's um, it's not a it's not a systemic herbicide. So like yes, you can spray it on weeds and it will not it'll it'll turn them brown and um, make them look ugly for a while. But what you will you may find is they will likely grow back. Um, so if you're trying to control weeds, I would say use a like a like a um, an actual herbicide that's labeled to do it, and that's gonna get that's gonna produce a better result. And then you're also not taking the chance of potentially damaging your lawn. You know what I mean? So. It's your call, Alfredo. I would use a herbicide that is safe for your grass type and to control the um, the weeds in your in your lawn. If you want to try the vinegar, you can. I just don't think it's going to produce as good results as what you are um, you're after. But it should be less risky than using um, glyphosate if that's what you're after. So uh, so yes, I hope that helps. And then D Mark Fort sixteen says, uh, "Thank you, Ron. You are very very welcome. You're very welcome." Very welcome. Thank you so much for all the questions and comments. Guys, gals, I think that's it. I see no other questions, nothing else. Um, actually, no, I, I lied. There's another one coming in here. I see one from uh, from Tito. From Tito Serrano. He says, how safe is Celsius uncertainty on the lawn after it's dry? Because my dogs like eating the grass. <laughs> I mean, like most herbicides, whenever you, you spray, pre-emergent, you spray any kind of herbicide, it's Spray the lawn, spray the um the the weed you're targeting, allow it to dry, and then it's safe to re-enter the lawn. So you could spray it and then re-enter the lawn like four or five hours later or wait till the following day. Um I've not heard of dog of a dog or being injured by eating grass that was sprayed with Celsius or certainty, but I I again I've never tested it myself. You know what I mean? I've never um I don't know how much grass your 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 dogs eat, and you know, I can't say I can't say um, with certainty, no pun intended, that there, there couldn't be a bad result. But I mean, you know, that those herbicides are used a lot on many lawns all throughout the Southeast. And I've, I have yet to hear of anyone that has dogs that have had a negative result from that. So big thing is keep them out of the lawn until the product dries and, uh, and you should be okay. But again, I've, I've never, I mean, could, has it ever happened? Possibly, but I've never, I've not heard of it. Not heard of it, Tito. So hope that helps. Um, what I say is spray the product, allow it to dry, keep the fur babies off the lawn for 24 hours. And then, you know, you should, and then kids, people, pets, um, you should be safe to allow them to, uh, to re-enter. Um, again, I've, I've gotten a lot of emails, a lot of questions from folks. I have yet to have an email from anyone saying, Hey, I, sprayed Celsius or certainty on my lawn and my dog got sick. So I, I'm again, not saying it can't happen, but I've just not, I've not experienced, I've never, I've never been asked that question or been reached out to by anyone that has had that experience. Big thing I would say is follow what the label says. So spray it, allow it to dry. If you're really being really um, particular, wait 24 hours and then you can re-enter the lawn. So hope that helps. Great, uh, great live stream, guys. Hopefully, you guys, you got some um, some value out of all the um, out of the content and on like the question of how to you take a lawn 
from this, from zero to hero, like what that process looks like. Hopefully you guys got some value out of the, the monologue earlier. And if you have any questions, any follow-up, feel free to reach out to me. Um, there's plenty of content on the Golf Course Lawn Store as far as the blog section on, on topics that dive deeper into that. If you're looking for your fertilizer, your pre-emergent, soil test kits, we've got those all in stock and ready to ship at the Golf Course Lawn Store. We really do appreciate your business support. And again, thank you guys for taking some time to hang out with me on a Friday night. Have an amazing weekend. Go out and do something fun in the lawn. Take care.